city. The city said no. Uh, the, the carpoolers from Watsonville having arrived. Um, <laughs> we're about ready to start our meeting, so if everybody would be seated, it'd be great. We couldn't do it without you. Oh, yeah. oh, thank you so much for waiting. Without, yeah. Fix those roads. Uh, right. <laughs> start earlier. <laughs> Oh, is that the answer? Either Start that or early. Take care. Wow. Hey, take Paracuse. I get you. Okay, you're, 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 okay, I will call the June 23rd, 2018 board meeting of the Santa Cruz Metropolitan Transit District to order. Uh, clerk, please call the roll. Director Bottor. Here. Director Chase. Here. Director Kaufman Gomez. Present. Director Dutra. Here. Director Hagen. Here. Director Leopold. Hey. Oh, here. here. <laughs> <laughs> That's you. Hello. <laughs> Direct, thank you. Director Lynn. Here. Director Matthews. Here. Director McPherson. Here. Director Rothwell. Here. Director Rotkin. He just had surgery, so a uh, knee surgery, I think, so he won't be here today. Thank you. Ex officio, Director Thomas. Okay. We have quorum. Um, we'd like to make a few announcements. Uh, Carlos Landavera is with us here to be available to those who need some Spanish language assistance. You might just uh, make a few comments, please. Placer. Good morning. Buenos dias, directors. Carlos Landaverri, your interpreter. Para las personas que necesiten o prefieren el español, voy a estar en la parte de atrás. Thank you. Uh, Gracias. Uh, that's about the extent of my Spanish right there. Gracias. <laughs> yeah, so thank you. But you know, anybody that needs his assistance, uh, please feel free to uh, contact him. Uh, and also, this meeting is being televised by Community Television of Santa Cruz County, Channel 26. And our technician is Mr. Lynn Dutton. Um, now we will go for to uh, Board of Directors comments. Any, any Board of Director have any comments? All right. Move on to any communications to the Board of Directors. Uh, anybody have any communications to the Board of Directors? Um, any written uh, comments from the MAC? Any? Yes, sir. Hi, Mike Paisano, uh, MAC Chair. Uh, thank you for letting me speak today. Um, and first off, I'd like to thank the um, Santa Cruz uh, Metro staff are doing an amazing job and what they've done with the budget that they have to deal with and managing with what they're managing. Um, first, I'd like to start off with, I've been a bus rider for now about six years now, and I find it very easily difficult, I guess. Easy part <coughs> is, I mean, I could get to any place I need to get to for $2, Watsonville and back for four. The difficulty comes into, for me at least, is some of the transfer timings especially with the 35 and 35A, sometimes you're just missing by a few seconds. And it could be painful, especially if you want to try to get home in a timely manner. It could be an hour and a half for me. Um, but the um, good points are um, uh, looking into possibly <clears throat> expanding the bike share program, which uh, I think would be a great uh, asset to the Metro. And then also adding um, uh, intelligent transportation system or AVS, a, a vehicle locator system. Um, it's not necessarily the frequency of the buses, but if we add the AVL, that would definitely help in the transportation needs. And then uh, the other thing was, um, I was really excited to hear about the Metro's plan for the downtown parking to add uh, uh, the Metro passes for the employees downtown. Uh, but then I was, listening to the downtown meeting on Tuesday about the garage and then the response that I was hearing back from um, was that it was a nice package, but it didn't take care of the early times and the late times. So maybe the Metro can work with the county and maybe other cities to make it more like uh, have an uh, earlier bus routes or later, like an all nighter, like they do in San Francisco to San Jose. Um, and then, and then my own personal note is um, I work in Scotts Valley at the uh, Enterprise Technology Center, uh, and the nearest bus stop is near uh, is at Kaiser, so that's like a 15 minutes walk. So we have about four or five of us that do make that trek uh, back and forth. Um, and not to throw data at you, but 
there's about 500 of us at UCSC, and then which is half the building, and the other half is probably another 500, and then plus with active sports, maybe we're talking 1,000 to 1,500 cars. Um, so anything to be done to add a closer bus stop to, um, for me, also add that positive appeal, because I'm trying to get coworkers to embrace more of the buses and the sustainable transportation, and it's a little bit difficult when, oh, the bus stop is way over here, and then you gotta worry about the transfer timing. So, um, Anything for the, uh, that could be done that would be uh, really helpful. So okay, I did have we did have you in uh, item 18 to, to um, oh. for some annual report. Is that it, or we, yes. you might be yep. coming back to us too? I don't sure, but no, okay. that was it. I thought okay, okay. I, I was fine. a little it's, bit ahead of time. I'm sorry. That's all right. That's mm -hmm. you know that's good if you're ahead of time. That's, that's <laughs> right. Yeah, <laughs> no, yeah I, no, I get get back to work though. <laughs> very good. Thank you, Mike. Thank you very much for your Michael. Thank you for your uh, for your work on the Mac. I know that you uh, follow lots of transportation issues uh, and really think about how they interact with uh, our our transit system. And I just appreciate your thoughtfulness in and looking at uh, all those issues. Uh, and but particularly your work on uh, in transit. So thank you. <clears> hey, <throat> okay, um, other comments coming from the MAC uh, Labor Organization Communications. Good morning. My name is Olivia Martinez. I am the SEAU representative for Metro. And. I have this following statement. I'm requesting this morning that the HR manager and its CFO be removed as the acting managers of the CSRs and they return to their duties. SAU feels that the general manager's decision to appoint them as acting managers is unfair to them and the organization. It's impacting the workers and labor relations. We believe it was short-sighted to hire the risk manager over a customer service manager given the problems we are dealing with. We need a full-time customer service manager with strong customer service skills that can turn around many years of bad management. The CSR department has been through many different transitions over the last four years and the transitions have not been done smoothly or in a professional manner. Both the CFO and HR manager are already overstretched and expected to take on this additional department and turn everything around in a few short months, which is creating an impact to our members. The general manager is creating timelines and requests that are creating unnecessary pressures and conflicts. For example, last minute decisions are being made, which creates communication problems, the need of training, and support for CSRs is not being met, and management is violating the MOU articles. I had asked um, the general manager a year ago to hire Nicole Young. Many of you guys know her. She's really well known in the community and has expertise to help with customer service. I have yet to see him hire her. In a personal note, as a woman and as a feminist, and I do feel that having these two women be pulled stretch so thinly to do so much, and it's creating all of these issues for us. I think there's some gender inequality issues that need to be looked at. Please consider our request. On another note, we are asking that Metro upload the salaries of its managers on the website, the same as it has done for UTU and SEIU employees. This is important for transparency. When CalPERS or anyone needs to find this information, it is difficult and time consuming to have to search through all of the board agendas to find the specific information they may need. Only non-management pay tables are posted on Metro's website. Management pay tables are, not notice are noticeably absent from Metro website. It is imperative that we have pay transparency for all employees equally at Metro. AMBAC has a link dedicated to AB 2040 to address the requirements for local agency to disclose the compensation of their employees on the website if they have a web presence. In the spirit of governmental disclosure and transparency, <coughs> we can expect, when can we expect management salary tables to be posted on Metro's website? 
let's say by June 30th, 2018. Lastly, our members are concerned with the SEAU class and comp study. SEAU Metro signed a side agreement which stated that the study would be completed by December 2018. <coughs> it has yet to even be started. SEIU members gave up a lot, including any COLA increase in 2018, with the agreement that this study would be completed this year. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Board of Directors, staff. I'm Eduardo Montesino, representing the bus operators and, and paratransit folks. Um, I do want to remind uh, Metro that they have an, uh, an obligation to um, come to the negotiating table again for the articulated bus. Um, so it's stated as a, a pilot program. That's what it is. Pilot program is done. Um, uh, we learned um, um, there was a, uh, uh, it was a good program, but um, in order to continue, we need to ne um, negotiate again. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning, board members. Uh, Michael, Re Michael Rios representing PSA out of the SEIU. So I just want to add on a little to the end of Olivia's speech about the class and comp. Now, I just want to uh, remind you all that we did give up a cost savings of $213,000 during our negotiations. And now all we're asking is just have the class and comp study done by December 30th, 2018. Um, like Olivia said, I don't believe that it has been started yet. So it's a, a little concerning. So, you know, our members are concerned and we're hope, in hope that uh, we can get that done. Thank you. Hi, Joan Jeffries, SEA president, and I just want to echo what Mike said, that we are concerned about that. Um, I believe there may be some issues with the vendor that has been doing the management class in comp, and we don't know how that's going to impact the SEA portion, but it obviously has delayed it, and we are we are concerned. Thank you. Thank you. Any other uh, communications from labor? Okay, we will move uh, on to item number eight. If there's any additional documentation to support existing agenda items, anything additional? Okay. Uh, we will move to the consent agenda. Oh, do we have somebody? Oh. Did I hear somebody? Welcome. <coughs> Sarah, right? Okay. Is that it? Yeah. Is it on? Push, turn the button. There you go. Morning. USA Pavilion. I'm here with Mr. Is that on? Oh, it should be. Closer. Good morning again. My name is Felipe de Leon. I'm here. Not only as a um, commission on disability, <coughs> we can't hear her. Is there? A, yeah, maybe get there. Sorry, Felipa. It's good for you. You get double time. See, that's <laughs> great. <laughs> Can you hear me now? No. Is that? I'll try and. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah, go yeah. ahead. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Sorry, right, Felipa. Okay, let me start again. <laughs> All right. Um, my name is Felipa. I'm here this morning not only as a commission on disability, but also uh, um, as a resident of Independence Square. I'm here for two reasons. First, to let you know that the residents of Independence Square are grateful that the um, Route 79 is now serving Crestview, the Crestview area, but also means losing the service to Pajaro that was provided to them. I'm asking you to please um, reinstate the service, even if it's only every other hour. The second reason is, as a commissioner, as I previously mentioned, that you should be expecting a letter um, from the Commission on Disabilities. I'm here to present this letter to you. Um, I'm on a, I am aware that there has been changes made recently, which I'm not too happy about. The Watsonville Transit Information Booth opened to serve the people of Watsonville. These early closures have a negative impact. Um, 
effects on two members of the Watson of the disability community that who have worked who work in the Monterey area and live in the Watsonville in, who live in Watsonville who are unable to take care of their metro related business needs like purchasing um, Paracruise tickets. I have asked these two members of the community to write a letter to you to let you know how the um, has how 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 have it has impacted impacted them. It makes me sad to, that they didn't want to because they believe that you don't care um, or would listen to their um, concern. I can't blame them. Our little transit center may not sell a lot of tickets like the Santa Cruz station. Watsonville may not be a tourist attraction, but we have our events where many people come to Watsonville. The people of Wat Watsonville are grateful that they no longer have to travel to Santa Cruz to take care of their transit needs. I'm asking you today to make the service you provide a bit better to the Watsonville residents and the disabled community and to promote the Watsonville Trans Transit Center a bit better. Thank you, gracias. Thank you, thank you for your efforts. The letter. Thanks, babe. Uh -huh. I'll make copies and email this to all of the okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's see. Good morning, directors. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. First, um, my apologies and then who I am and why I'm here. My apologies. After years of going to meetings, I, I keep waiting for the queue of oral communications, and I didn't realize that the queue was communications to the board of directors. So I, I missed my queue, and so I'm, I'm sorry to have coming at this later time. Yeah. But I do have what I used to call an oral communication to share. Um, I'm John Doherty. Um, I'm here to um, give some background to Felipe de Leon's comments. Felipe and I serve as the co-chairs on the Santa Cruz County Commission on Disabilities. Also, um, I've served at Metro currently as the Accessible Services Coordinator, and I have also had the pleasure of closing the information booth at the Santa Cruz Metro for over eight years as a customer service representative. I'm here today just to bring out some changes to your attention and you know, question the direction that that's going in. Last year, I think last June, when um, there was the ribbon cutting ceremony at the Watsonville Transit Center, um, the Pajaronian covered the event and their coverage included this quote, these quotes. Um, Director Jimmy Dutra said that not only will the um, Transit Center have its first customer service booth in 16 years, but it's also the first time that it is a full-time position. We are pleased to bring this customer service to Southern Santa Cruz County. The Watsonville Transit Center provides a dry, safe, and comfortable place for riders and residents to wait for the bus. It's not going to stop with this, he said. Well, when those words were spoken, there were two shifts, two customer service representatives there. There were two workstations. Uh, the posted hours were eight to five uh, for our public in Watsonville. Today, we have one customer service person, one workstation, and the likelihood that the booth will be closed at least an hour and a half, if not more, during that eight to five span because that single employee has breaks and an hour lunch to account for. Um, I'm not convinced that this is the direction we should be going in for our residents, for our customers in Watsonville. Thank you for letting me share this information. Okay, thank you. We'll, I think we should put oral communications <clears throat> to the board of directors uh, from now on in the agenda. That'd probably be the best place. Um, any other comments? Okay, we don't have, uh, we will move on to the consent agenda. Um, anybody want to uh, pull any items or is there any, anybody from the public that would like to pull a consent item? Anybody from the board? I would move the consent agenda. 
Moved and seconded, the consent agenda be approved. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? <coughs> so ordered unanimously. Uh, we do have a few uh, longevity, longevity awards, but I understand, I do not think these individuals are here, but I would like to announce them and we, can, uh, we will give them their plaques later. Uh, first of all was Karen Blight, who has been here for 10 years. Uh, it's item number 10, and then Serafin Ruiz, who has been here for 20 years. Uh, are either Serafin or Karen here? Well, uh, we thank you for your total 30 years of service to Metro. It's very much appreciated. And then we have some retiree uh, resolutions. Uh, item number 11, Stephen Marcus, 1999 to 2018, 20 years. Stephen's not here. Uh, Sharon Toline. I think I pronounced that correctly, uh, 1996 to 2018. Uh, Sharon here, no, but uh, we want to th thank them very much for their services to, uh, for Metro and to the general public. Um, we will give them their, uh, their awards and cert cert uh, certificates a little later. Um, let's see, we, oh, excuse me, oh, excuse me. Oh, I'm so sorry. moved. Yes. Second. Okay, thank you. Move right along here. Okay, we will move on to item number 12, the uh, oral report from the uh, CEO, Alex Clifford. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, directors, four brief items for you. First of all, I'd like to introduce our new manager of safety and risk, Shanoa Reddick. Uh, Shanoa, you want to come up and be introduced? And I'll just uh, give you a little bit of background about Shanoa. Uh, he was born at Dominican Hospital and raised in Santa Cruz County. He's married with two school-aged children in the Pajaro Valley Unified School District. Uh, Santa Cruz, he's been a uh, Santa Cruz County paramedic for 15 years, 10 of which he was a supervisor for AMR. Uh, he has his Associate of Science in Occupational Safety and Health from Columbia Southern University and his Bachelor's Degree in Occupational Safety and Health from Columbia Southern University. Um, an Associate Safety and Health Manager Certification from the Institute of Safety and Health Management. And then most recently, he was the Safety Manager and DOT Expert for a large motor coach carrier in San Jose. Uh, so I hope you will agree we found someone with quite the credentials to nice. fill this position. Mm -hmm. And the local. It. And welcome, we'd, uh, we welcome you to make a few comments. Thank you, Board, and uh, thank you, Mr. Clifford. Uh, I'm very proud to be here. Um, born and raised in this county, love this county. Have some kids in this county. Uh, don't plan on leaving anytime soon, and uh, it's an honor to be here. I, I hope to serve the county as I have in the past and in a new position here at Metro, and I, I want to say thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Glad to thank have Thank you very, Welcome. very much. Welcome aboard. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then uh, as we have started recently, I like uh, on my monthly report to talk about new hires and promotions. So just ever so briefly, we hired Mary, I think it's pronounced Gallette, uh, as a customer service representative. Um, we just met Shanoa. Uh, and then in the way of promotions, we have uh, Lu Lucas Iraguchi, who's gone from a facilities maintenance worker two, I'm sorry, from a facilities maintenance worker one to a facilities maintenance worker two. So always exciting when we have an in internal promotions. Uh, another internal promotion, um, I'm pleased to announce that Daniel Zaragoza has uh, gone through the process of being interviewed along with others to replace uh, April and has prevailed in taking over that position as the paratransit superintendent. And again, another internal promotion. Daniel has done a wonderful job for many years. And then we also stand up and say hello. Yeah, and say hello. There you go. Right there. Got it. Everybody knows Daniel. He he does an outstanding job for us, and uh, my understanding is he did very well in in this process. So congratulations, Daniel. Uh, also, equal kudos to Leo Pena. Leo, I think, is in the room too. Leo. And Leo, Leo goes from transit supervisor to the safety and training coordinator. You heard earlier in the agenda that Sharon Toline has retired. Leo has competed to take over that position. So, uh, and he's been sort of an understudy, I think, for Sharon over the last several months. And 
really good good effort and thank you for what you've done and as I understand he did very well too in the the process of uh, sort of competition to to uh, to become the, uh, the person to fill this position so thank you Leo for job well done and a couple other things I want to cover uh, as we have talked about for several months the APTA Universities Conference is here it's it you know people will start registering tomorrow and uh, I think all of the the formal types of uh, events will start occurring on Sunday and let me just ask Barrow if he would just come up and give a quick plug for that and then I'll go on to the last item that we have. Thank you Alex, uh, Chair, Board, Staff and Public. Yeah, just real quickly the focus for us as he said is Sunday as is traditional in these conferences on Sunday from 9.45 until noon will be the local show. Donna Lynn will end, uh, welcome as the host city. Bruce and Alex will be involved. UCSC student Alice Malmberg will be involved. And then Larry and I and Zach from Cabrillo will do the local story as is traditional in these things. And we look forward to seeing as many of you as possible at the reception that evening, which is being hosted by Gillig and Meritor. So uh, we're looking forward to letting all these other entities from around the country see us and hear our story because it's one of the more interesting ones in the college transit relationship business. So thanks for everybody's support in the last few months getting together and the weather is supposedly good Sunday. Yes, sir. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Beryl. And then just digressing, uh, and I have a omission here. So we have uh, Maritza Mendoza, another internal uh, promotion from paratransit dispatcher to admin supervisor of ops. Maritza, I understand, is in the room. You wouldn't mind. <laughs> Sorry, Maritza, for not having you on that original list, but we, we caught you just in time. Thank you for being here. And then finally, uh, Gina's going to put up uh, three very quick videos. This is video coverage. Uh, this is coverage on television of our Measure D and SB1 Media event. Uh, we got really good coverage. I need to stall because she's running across here. Um, <laughs> Must have heard her name. I'm going to fill some dead air for a few moments. Uh, but as you recall, and, and I don't know if you saw on television, but uh, uh, KSBW did a great segment. They split it up into a 5 o'clock hour and a 6 o'clock hour. Some redundancy of the two, but some additional information added in the 6 o'clock hour. And then KION, I thought, just did an outstanding job. Um, probably the best of all of the coverage. And uh, so with that, Gina, are you ready? Yeah, see? <laughs> Can you turn that volume? Yeah. Is it not connected to the microphone, maybe? Or? No, it was earlier. Well, Santa Cruz Metro has 98 buses total, but they say 62 of those need to be replaced. Today, they showed us three... Hope you're all good at reading lips. ...air buses <laughs> that will replace some of those old... This was all funded through Senate Bill 1, also known as the gas tax. That was our practice. <laughs> it was just perfect before we all got here. More than half of the Santa Cruz Metro buses need replacing, and today Metro rolled out 18 pieces of new equipment. KION's Ashley Keen joins us live in Santa Cruz tonight with how this is all funded and when we might see more. Well, Santa Cruz Metro has 98 buses total, but they say 62 of those need to be replaced. Today, they showed us three of the new clean air buses that will replace some of those older ones, along with 12 vans and three Paracruz transit vans. This was all funded through Senate Bill 1, also known as the gas tax, and Measure D, a Santa Cruz County sales tax passed in 2016. Now there are talks of repealing Senate Bill 1, but Metro employees say that would be a big setback. I will struggle with finding the money to replace equipment and I will be running older equipment, older and older equipment, which unfortunately will break down, will make our service less dependable, and we won't be able to do the things that we do at this agency, and we promise the customers we will deliver to them, which is on-time service. Metro 
Metro provides an average of 5 million trips for people a year. They say 80% of those riders do not have any other means of transportation. And coming up at 6, I'll have when they're expected to roll out more new buses, along with when they're going to roll out the fully electric buses. It will be the first fully electric bus in the county. Live in Santa Cruz, Ashley Keene, KION News Channel 546. County Metro system getting a revamp thanks to funding from Measure D and Senate Bill 1. They're adding more than a dozen new buses and vans. KIO's Ashley King gives us a look at the new resources. And I ride the bus all the time. We realized that we didn't have to have a car and that we could get around by bus. Today, 18 new vans and clean air buses were rolled out to replace some of the older equipment. The Santa Cruz County Metro says they provide an average of 5 million trips a year. 80% of those people do not have a different, a, a, their own mode of transportation. So they're, they're dependent on our metro service. Some of the buses being used date back to 1998, making them 20 years old. And the normal bus's lifespan is only 12 years. More than half of the buses in the fleet here in Santa Cruz need to be replaced or updated, but I'm told without SB1 funding, that money would be very hard to find. Senate Bill 1, better known as the gas tax, along with Measure D, a Santa Cruz County sales tax passed in 2016, made getting new equipment possible. Now, there's talk of repealing SB1. While it's not officially on the November ballot yet, many have expressed their dislike of it. Metro says taking that away would be a big setback. I will struggle with finding the money to replace equipment, and I will be running older equipment, older and older equipment, which unfortunately will break down, will make our service less dependable, and we won't be able to do the things that we do at this agency, and we promise the customers we will deliver to them, which is on-time service. Metro employees say they will be getting six more clean air buses and four electric buses in early 2019, the California Air Resources Board wants Metro to be 100% electric by 2040. In Santa Cruz, Ashley Keene, KION News Channel 546. A, long a new set of wheels are on the streets in Santa Cruz. The Transportation Agency unveiled 18 new buses and vans to replace its aging fleet. Six million dollars for the new fleet came from voter-approved Measure D and State Senate Bill 1, approved by Governor Brown in 2017. So when you think about a fleet of 98 and 62 buses being well past their useful life, um, that's important to us to pay attention to because when those buses age, they can tend to break down more frequently, and as buses break down more frequently, then we are not delivering the service that we promised the customers. The newer buses are also more environmentally friendly and uh, come with lower emissions. So, so Mr. Chair, uh, certainly we have uh, Josh, our uh, state legislative uh, lobbyist here with us today, and he'll talk a little bit more about what's going on with uh, the SB1 challenge. But uh, good coverage that we had, and hopefully that process of beginning to educate the voters of Santa Cruz County about the importance of SB1 to this agency and our and the impact of that on our ability to purchase equipment in the coming years. We can't buy all of those 60 plus buses in one year. It's going to take many years to do that and we need those kinds of dedicated resources like SB1 and Measure D provide. Any questions uh, for uh, Director Matthews. Just a quick one, and uh, a quick answer is fine for right now. Um, I'm just curious to know the status of the studies about um, Pacific Station and delivery model. Sure. Uh, Barry, do you want to give a real brief uh, just quick, presentation quick. on that? And then you have an item on your agenda, too, relative to that. Yeah. Right. In the consent agenda, you approved the contract with the second of the two studies. Yeah. So real quickly, we're about halfway through the first one, which was the strategic look at how we deliver service downtown. That should be done late July, so we'll be seeing you in committees and board in August or so. And the second one is preparing a bunch of alternative concept layouts of the current station with the adjacent city properties. And that should hit about three or four weeks out after 
the first one. So through the August, September timeframe, we'll have the results of both products. Thanks. I just want a general timeline. Yeah, thank you. Any other comments? Uh, board? Okay, we'll um, move on to, um, that's uh, your report's completed then, Mr. Clifford? Yes, sir. Right. Okay. Um, we have now a presentation, oral presentation of uh, Santa Cruz class 33 graduates of Leadership Santa Cruz. It's a tremendous program that's uh, been going on for 33 years and it's been really well received. I'm glad that we are able to have some of our employees that participate in that. Yeah, we, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. We are, we are lucky to have this program here in Santa Cruz County and fortunate to have the uh, ability to identify up to three people each year to participate in that program. There's a little bit of an exchange that we do. We, we use our buses to help uh, guide the, the particular class to various venues around the county. So it's a nice trade-off. Um, I'd like to introduce, reintroduce Leo Pena um, and also Pete Rasmussen. Pete, I think I saw Pete in the audience. Uh, they are our recent graduates from class 33 and um, I would welcome uh, either or both of them to say something about the program and, and the value. Thank you. Congratulations and thank you for participating. <laughs> I, <clears throat> yeah, I'd like to thank uh, Metro for giving us the opportunity to participate in Leadership Santa Cruz County. It was a very rich experience getting to learn about the history and the institutions, the community organizations. A lot of them I had never heard of, but there's a wealth of community organizations in this county and a lot of unique experiences. You know it's an interesting program when one month you're touring underneath the boardwalk and later you're on the inside of a jail cell. So <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Morning board, uh, Leo Pena. Uh, I just wanna thank you guys for giving me the opportunity to be in this uh, leadership program. It was a great program, uh, I learned a lot. Uh, gave me great, um, just overall perspective of what goes on in the county and uh, learned a lot from it. So I thank you for giving me the opportunity. Good. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank, thank you for dedicating the time. <laughs> Big commitment of, of time and, and we're uh, again grateful to have these folks that are willing to to also volunteer to be a part of the program. Um, I'd, I'd no. like to just make a quick comment. Sure. I'm so pleased that Metro invests in its employees on a regular basis in sending them to leadership because I think the two of you who have participated, you've worked here a long time. You think you know the community and you're in that program. You learn so much. It really enriches how Metro connects to the community and is represented in that whole leadership cohort. It's, it's just, it's a wonderful program and it's terrific that the public entities are involved as well as private and nonprofit. Right. It's a tremendous program. It's great to have and they can spread the word too. It's, you never knew how little you knew about Santa Cruz <laughs> County until you participated in it, I think. Uh, so congratulations and thank you. And I'm glad we're continuing that. And, and then just a couple other quick notes. I do wanna put a, a shout out for Pete who just returned from uh, Los Angeles on a three-day uh, seminar about uh, bus rapid transit. So we'll be, we'll be working him over over the next uh, coming months to find out what he learned and how we can apply that to here at Metro. So Pete, thank you too for uh, spending three days uh, down there in, in uh, the smog-ridden Los Angeles. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so finally, just to introduce our class 34, and that'll be Jolene Church, our HR manager, Gina Pye, Freddie and Freddie Roca, is Freddie here? No, nope, we didn't get Freddie. Okay, so Freddie. So those three will be our next class, and, and a year from now they'll be here to tell you what they learned. Great. I'm glad we're continuing that effort. Thank you very much. Okay, and now we will have an introduction uh, of new operators, and I think I'd like to introduce a new grandpa, uh, our CEO, Mr. Alex Clifford. <laughs> <laughs> We start calling you Grandpa Clifford now instead of CEO or general manager. Everybody who knows me knows I'm rejecting the term grandpa. <laughs> and going in favor of the Italian version, which is no no. Yeah. <laughs> My daughter just doesn't want him to learn no no so fast. <laughs> okay, do, do we do have some new operators. Is that correct, uh, Cheryl? Cyril Geary, uh, Chief Operations Officer. It's uh, a pleasure to introduce uh, the new operator class um, that's been moving right along. They've 
had uh, their version of night driving, which I'm sure was a challenge to everyone here. And I'd like to thank Leo Pena for taking on this class and moving it forward in the direction that we want it to be. Uh, I'm very pleased with the results, and I'll let uh, Leo introduce them, and they can introduce themselves one by one. Thank you. Or good morning, board again. Um, yeah, got a new class. I've been working hard. Uh, just started night driving this week. Uh, we're going to continue next week. And um, yeah, they're doing well. I'll let them introduce themselves to you guys. Um, so yeah, here's a new class. Thank you. To <laughs> say a few words, thank you very much. Welcome. Hi, my name is Miguel Cabrera. It's uh, nice to see you all. And I thank you for the opportunity to work for Santa Cruz Metro. Thank you. Welcome. Welcome. Good morning. My name is Jorge Gallegos. Um, thank you for giving us the opportunity to work for this county and uh, great community. Thank you. Welcome. Hello. My name is Jerry Chavez. I'm excited to serve the Santa Cruz County. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, board. I'm Adrian Jimenez. Uh, I'm jumping from Paracruz over to Fix Route, and I'm very happy and honored to. Uh, work for such a great company. Thank you. Welcome. Good morning. Uh, my name is Michael Richards, and I just want to thank you and everyone for um, giving me the opportunity, and I look forward to being of service to the community. Thank, thank you, you very much, and congratulations to all. Uh, You are the eyes and ears of our district, so uh, the Metro District, so we thank you for your service and uh, congratulations. Mr. Chair, could we take a quick picture of the, uh, the new sure. class with the chair and, and vice chair? Sure. You want, to, you want it down there? Sure. Photo op. Come on, guys. <laughs> I'll be down there. Yeah. Yeah, and it was great that they he mentioned in the spirit of organizations he never knew existed. <laughs> yeah, and how true you're at the boardwalk and one woman in there jails and movement. Granola bars back there. We, we politicians always take advantage of a photo op, so thank you very much uh, for that. Um, now we will move on to the state legislative update by Gr Josh Shaw. Um, welcome, Josh. It's good to see you again, and uh, thank you. It's uh, been an interesting year, I'm sure, in Sacramento. It has. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the board. Joshua Shaw, president of Shaw Yoder Antwi, pleased to represent Metro in the state halls of the Capitol in Sacramento. Has been an interesting year. Uh, no, no, Clifford, uh, excuse me, CEO Clifford has asked me to go over <laughs> some of the major uh, recent developments as well as ongoing developments. And frankly, the news clips that we just saw, saw really lay out two of the key things I was going to talk about. And we'll get into some details on Senate Bill 1 and the imminent threat to that landmark transportation funding, as well as the upcoming, we think, mandate for all transit agencies to move to zero emission buses. But to set the stage for you real quick, the legislature in Sacramento is finishing up its biennium. Uh, this year they will adjourn on August 31st. That will be the second year of the two-year 2017-2018 session. Um, they really, in two weeks, go on a summer break of about a month. So we're six months into what is effectively a seven-month working uh, session. That means bills introduced this year have to have left their House of Origin. Senate bills need to be over into the Assembly by now. Assembly bills need to be over into the Senate by now, or they're dead for the year. Uh, some bills died last year. The governor's acted on a few bills, but of the 5,500-plus 5, bills that have been introduced so far, 
about 1,000 or so are still alive and moving. So there will be a sprint, in other words, in August when they come back from their summer recess to get the work done and put to bed for the rest of the year. Uh, just a couple notes about uh, the recent primary election. On June 5th, voters did approve Proposition 69, a measure put on the ballot by the legislature last year. We talked in uh, April last time I was here last year about the passage of Senate Bill 1, which you just saw uh, some news coverage on. Concurrent with that bill, the legislature put on the ballot a constitutional amendment to protect those funds, as well as some additional transit funds that have been kind of constitutionally loose for a few years, and now those were all over overwhelmingly protected by the voters who passed Prop 69 by a 80% plus margin. Uh, also of note, the state Senate did lose its supermajority in terms of Democratic uh, members when Senator Josh Newman from Orange County was recalled on that same day, ostensibly because of his vote on Senate Bill 1. He was one of uh, 27 senators that voted for the landmark transportation measure, but nonetheless, his voters did uh, recall him. Let me turn to the state budget. Last Thursday, folks, the legislature sent to the governor of the 2018 2019 state budget. Not much in new transportation news, which is actually a good thing because we're trying to concentrate in, in Sacramento and, and through our stakeholder allies' uh, preservation of Senate Bill 1. Uh, but the underlying revenue pro projections in the governor's budget show a combination of existing consumption patterns and tax rates on the, the, the fuels and items that support public transit funding are up even since his January budget proposal. In January, we got the first look at the budget. They passed it last week. His, uh, the governor's projections are updated. For instance, the state transit assistance program, which goes out by formula to all transit agencies, is up about 17% from what we thought it would be in just January and the total projected 18-19 program should be about 28% higher than the current year that ends right in about eight days. Um, that's about a $770 million program statewide. It used to be 200, 300 million statewide. That was before Senate Bill 1. So about half that new money is Senate Bill 1 related, and I think Metro gets roughly in the new year about $3 million. So that's a significant source of new and ongoing transit funding. Today and over this weekend, the legislature will probably be finishing up its negotiations with the governor on another major spending category that helps public transit agencies, the cap and trade program. You'll remember that for several years now, the Air Resources Board has been running a market-based program where polluters are capped in terms of their emissions. If they can't change their processes uh, uh, and their emissions are gonna be up here, they can actually pay for the difference by contributing to this fund we call cap and trade. The legislature gets to allocate about 60% of it. Some of it is hardwired to go to transit. The low carbon transit operations program will be, will be about $114 million in 1819. And there is a large competitive program that we can pursue for, for instance, new zero emission buses, the transit and inner city rail capital program, sh which should be about $473 million in 1819. By the way, about half that amount for that big competitive program also comes from Senate Bill 1. So if Senate Bill 1 were to be repealed, there'd be half as much money to go around for these kinds of purposes. One of the uh, discretionary programs that the legislature is looking at putting together in this final cap and trade deal, which we think they'll vote on next week before they take their summer break, is to help agencies like yours purchase new zero emission buses. That means usually battery electric or hydrogen electric buses. Uh, the Air Resources Board runs something called the Hybrid and Zero Emission Truck and Bus Voucher Incentive Project. I don't know why that's such a long name, but that's a program where they help reimburse public agencies for the incremental cost increase of this new zero emission technology. The legislature is looking at uh, putting in about $125 million statewide. That about doubles what the ARB thought they would have to work with. So that would help agencies like Metro purchase new zero emission buses. So let me transition into a few different points, larger points about zero emission buses. As the news clip said this morning, we all believe that the Air Resources Board is going to mandate probably this year uh, through its regulatory ability that all public transit agencies ultimately convert their entire bus fleet to zero emission, to electricity. Uh, as your CEO was talking about on the news, it's hard enough right now with the existing funding to maintain our current fleet. The new technology is more expensive. It's not as reliable as your traditional buses. Uh, and the transit folks have been making that case to the ARB and really working on a form of a regulation uh, that acknowledges that's probably where the state's gonna go ultimately, but we need to do it in a way that does not threaten your budgets, does not make you trade off new technology for reduced service. That would be a horrible result for your citizens. And in fact, uh, CEO Clifford has been front and center with a small group of transit managers from around the state who are negotiating with the top staff at the Air Resources Board 
on the form of this regulation. We're fighting for more flexibility, recognizing again that the state regulators are probably going to go in this direction. In fact, a couple of weeks ago, I had a chance to talk with Governor Brown about this developing regulation because he essentially controls the Air Resources Board appointments. And while he acknowledged our, some of our points about the current technology is not where we want it to be, it's too expensive right now, it's not as reliable, uh, and he said he would work with me to, to, to work with ARB staff and making sure that they give us the flexibility we need. He did tell me when, he, when we concluded our talk that, you know, Josh, this is the way we need to go. So he clearly is in favor of a mandate and I think this year, the last six months of his administration, he probably is going to want to see his Air Resources Board impose some regulation like this. So again, you're directly represented in the working group that is negotiating this. In fact, it's been meeting every week uh, since mid-January. So thank you for the time that Alex has been able to spend on uh, making sure this thing does not um, ruin your transit service in the, in name of, in the name of new, new vehicles. To, so, so I've talked about some funding available for electric buses. There's also the question of what do you pay in terms of the electricity rates. The California Public Utilities Commission, which obviously works with and has oversight over the uh, investor-owned utilities and other electrical companies, just last month worked out a deal with the three major IOUs, PG&E, Southern California Edison, et cetera, where they will be bringing almost a billion dollars in new investments to the table, mostly for electric charging infrastructure. Right now, if the mandate came on tomorrow, you'd have to take out all your existing fueling equipment and put in electric charging stations, also expensive. So there will be some new monies from the regulatory agencies, including uh, PG&E, which will, uh, uh, combined with Southern California Edison, make available to transit agencies, uh, as well as school, school bus uh, uh, operators and other heavy-duty operators, almost $230 million statewide. About $52 million of that will be guaranteed for transit. That's some advocacy work we did at the CPUC. For PG&E, their Fleet Ready program will be a grant program that they will make available, and we'd like to work with your staff to make sure we understand how to uh, put Metro front and center as you begin to experiment with zero emission buses. That's on the charging side. Relative to what you pay for electricity, some transit agencies across the state are already experimenting with zero emission buses, and we're seeing that their operating costs compared to traditionally fueled uh, buses, whether diesel fuel or compressed natural gas, can be 20 to 40 percent higher, meaning the rate of electricity they pay to run these buses is higher than what they would have run for the same bus on natural gas or diesel fuel. The CPUC also approved PG&E's commitment to introduce a new electric vehicle rate design proposal uh, that is supposed to benefit heavy-duty customers like a transit agency. That's a good thing, but there's no guarantee uh, that it'll give the rate relief that we would need. Um, that's why I want to turn next to a couple of bills that are moving through the legislative process in Sacramento. Senate Bill 1434 was introduced by the California Transit Association to require the CPUC to require that the investor-owned utilities come up with transit-supportive rate designs. This is actually a legislative proposal that was made by uh, uh, C.O. Clifford and, and his colleague uh, Carl Sidorik at Monterey Salinas Transit a couple years ago. So that bill's come to fruition. It's moved out of the Senate which, with a lot of support. It's moving through the Assembly right now, and we are getting pretty good signals um, that that could be signed. So as much as we just got some funding from PG&E, we're also looking to tell the CPC to tell the utilities, you got to acknowledge that your rates can't be so high for transit agencies that they cannot put out the service that is expected with these zero emission buses. I should uh, also uh, mention Senate Bill 1119 by Senator Bell. He's the chair of the Senate Transportation Committee. Uh, he's got a bill that would adjust the statutes relative to the Low Carbon Transit Operations Program. That's the cap and trade funded program that I mentioned a, a minute ago that goes out, sends funding out by formula to all the transit agencies. Current law requires that transit agencies have to spend 50% uh, of their monies on uh, benefiting those in disadvantaged communities, which is a laudable goal. But for a community like this, the definition of disadvantaged community is so narrow Geographically, there are only very few places in your operating district where you could actually spend this money, and, and that area might already be saturated, if you will, or, or have sufficient service. So this bill would loosen up the requirements a little bit, add some additional kinds of communities that I think score well here in Santa Cruz and across your operating district, and that bill is moving, out, it's out of the Senate already and moving through the Assembly. So that should pro provide some uh, funding relief, some programming relief for Santa Cruz Metro. And then a bill, uh, one final bill, it's already actually been signed by the governor, Assembly Bill 3124, introduced earlier this year. 
long story short, helps uh, transit agencies with articulated buses. And you, of course, have been working with UC Santa Cruz for a three bus demonstration project up there on the campus, those large buses with the uh, accordion in the middle. The law currently uh, says that if you can, you put a bike rack on the front of the bus, and of course, folks who ride bikes, very popular in terms of transit service, there's been a weird adverse uh, measurement from the CHP in some communities across the state that says the most regularly available bike rack is four inches longer than state law allows. So this bill extends the state law by four more inches, basically retroactively grandfathering the equipment that's out there on all of our articulated transit buses anyway. Luckily, the, the governor signed that bill, so you're, uh, demo program up at UCSC, which is uh, you know dormant for the summer recess, but we'll start back up in the fall. It'll be legal in terms of the bike racks that have been on those buses, so that's a good thing. Mr. Chair, let me close with Senate Bill 1, obviously the landmark uh, Road Repair and Accountability Act of 2017 that we've been talking about advocating for for more than two years, signed last year, now funding all the programs that I've mentioned. You saw the clips. Um, one of the, the questions that the reporter raised in the clips was, will a repeal of SB 1 happen. For months now, the proponents of repealing that measure have been gathering and submitting signatures to the Secretary of State. Last month, they submitted over 960,000 signatures. And again, long story short, last night, the campaign consultant who represents the interest groups who are advocating against repeal told me that based on the rate of qualification of verification of valid signatures, that frankly, tonight, or Monday morning, we're gonna learn that the repeal has qualified. Of course, we'll let your staff know the moment that's official and you'll see it in the press. But that's uh, bad news for folks who believe there needs to be continued transit funding, streets and roads uh, funding and highway funding. We think it will qualify. The measure, just again, just to be clear, would repeal, if the voters voted for this repeal measure on the first Tuesday in November, it would instantly repeal the revenues that have been generated and would be generated going forward by Senate Bill 1, so that almost doubling of state transit assistance would go away. All the $250 million for uh, new zero emission buses that we, you can compete for would go away. A campaign committee has been formed, the Coalition to Protect Local Transportation Improvements. That group, really led by the California Transit Association, League of California Cities, California State Association of Counties, uh, the California Alliance for Jobs, which represents the construction industry that works on infrastructure projects, as well as the unionized labor groups that work on those projects. They came together to run the Yes on Prop 69 campaign in June, which again was uh, uh, voted on overwhelmingly they pivot instantly to become the no on repeal of SB1. And next week, if the Secretary of State, in fact, uh, uh, tells us that the measure has qualified, they'll assign a proposition number, and the campaign will, will uh, convert instantly into the no on proposition, whatever it is. It'll probably be 70 something. Um, so a lot of work has been done already to explore in terms of opinion polling and voter research, how the voters feel about um, repealing what the news clip called the gas tax. In fact, it's larger than that. It's the Road Repair and Accountability Act of 2017. Um, I'll tell you very quickly, and then I'm happy to answer questions, that initially if you say, don't you want your gas tax to go down, of course, a majority of folks say, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. But we have learned through a lot of detailed focus work, focus group work and opinion polling across the state, that if the right message gets out, the voters are less interested in doing away with this funding source. If you ask questions like, did you know that we can't uh, uh, repair the potholes in your streets? Did you know that transit service might shrink? Voters are less interested in getting uh, rid of this money. So uh, folks like Governor Brown and others are hard at work making sure there will be adequate resources to get the message out. Uh, uh, of course, your agency as a public agency can't tell your voters how to vote one way or the other, but the clips that we just saw are literally the perfect kind of example of things I've been urging my public transit agency clients to do for quite a while now, which is explain to your communities, explain to the public, explain to the press what the implications will be. That you can do. If this funding goes away, here's the number of the 68 buses that we can't replace. Here's the service that might have to shrink, or here's the service we can't expand. Those things you can explain quite clearly in your public role, and we'd urge, frankly, all of you to continue to do that. I know you all do a very good job of that here. But we're gonna need more of that in the next three months, or the voters will face a more difficult decision than we think they need to face. They need to understand the positive implications of the funding that has come online, and the negative implications if that funding goes away. So, Mr. Chair, let me conclude right there, and I am happy to answer any questions about any of that material. Thank you for that very uh, 
information filled uh, report from the state. I, I really do appreciate in your work that you do for us and I want to thank uh, our CEO to Alice Clifford for being at the table in these discussions. It's really valuable and uh, he's got tremendous knowledge of how this works. And um, a couple things, I mean, I've say something about SB1 in one form or another. We all know the value of that to our local governments. Uh, half of that money goes to the state, half of it to local governments. Yep. Uh, but um, I just, I can't overemphasize, uh, it's a critical factor that we're, it's, it kind of leaves us frozen. We want to do some things. We want to repair buses, et cetera. But until we know the outcome of that in November, uh, we would be foolish to really uh, commit any uh, for, uh, uh, additional resources, financial resources. Um, I do want to, I, I want to thank, uh, you know, the utility companies too for coming forward and helping us, uh, all of us, uh, address our um, the needs for electrical buses and so forth. I do want to mention that uh, Mr. Clifford and I met with the CEO of Monterey Bay Community Power to see how how that might apply and how that can be used to the best of our abilities as well. So uh, we're, um, uh, we're, we're, we're on top of it, I think. Uh, we just hope that the right outcome uh, is uh, the voters get to that. I just saw a poll that LA Times, I think 51% were for the repeal, 38% were against, but no campaigning has started. And I right. know we're not we're not here to campaign, but um, we it's, it's going to be a tight vote. There's no question, one way or the other. That's right. Um, but uh, thank you for your uh, efforts. Uh, historically, I've known you for a long time, and you do uh, you're highly respected up there, and we're surely glad to have you on our team in Sacramento, as our team that. in Sacramento. You, sure. Any questions from the board, uh, Mr. Leopold? Uh, uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you for the presentation. I'm very interested in the bill of the, uh, talking about uh, disadvantaged communities right. and uh, and uh, and it, it sort of broadening that a little bit because yep. that has been a big uh, struggle uh, um, in uh, seeking funding. I know we've sought funding for down in Watsonville, and there's only a small section of Watsonville, and we couldn't actually get it because it's just not big enough to right. to to uh, uh, to qualify. Um, the status, uh, the, the status of that bill again, and sure. it, what, are there are other things that we could be doing uh, to be helpful with the passage of that bill. Appreciate the question. The bill has moved out of the Senate. It was sponsored by a senator, so uh, uh, the right action took place in the Senate. It's just about to have its first policy committee hearing in the Assembly. Um, just to, to describe a little bit more detail how it works, the, the thought behind the investments across the cap and trade program and the combination with disadvantaged communities is that most of these investments stay in place. You're talking about like energy projects and, and, and energy conservation projects that, that are physically in one place. Of course, transit moves one bus all across, could, could move one bus all across the community. The bill, for instance, in terms of the different flexibility aspects, would allow new or expanded transit service that connects with transit service that serves a disadvantaged community, uh, recognizing that people aren't just traveling in this one community. So those dollars would become available. Um, in terms of what you can do, uh, the, ag the agency has been supporting that bill and we've been advocating in terms of our delegation making sure that they support us as well as others who are voting on it. Um, I think anything uh, that you could do locally over the next couple weeks to, if anybody runs across members of your delegation, particularly in the assembly, particularly Assemblymember Stone and or Assemblymember Caballero, reminding them that this is a good bill for the reasons stated. When they get back to work after the summer recess, that'll be probably the final push on the bill in August, and that's when we want them front of mind remembering, oh yeah, SB 1119 is a good bill. And uh, maybe it would be helpful for us at our, I guess the question is, would it be helpful at our boards or councils to take a position and, and uh, let people know. Absolutely. If we they're not going to take it back to August, yep. we might be able to get that in. Yep. We would love county support. We would love individual city support. Again, the bill will probably get to the governor in late August, but he's got the month of September to act on the thousand plus bills that will come to him. So even a letter to the governor by that time, if not the delegation, would be helpful. Great. Well, uh, uh, Mr. Clifford, if you could uh, put together a, a, a fact sheet for us, that that's something that we can all take back to our jurisdictions. Um, the other thing I just want to say about uh, SB1, um, uh, I know how hard we fought for the, to get that those resources. And uh, when the poll that was talked about, you know, <laughs> seeing 51% against um, was uh, one, lot, one part dispiriting and one part uh, uh, showed that, that there was, we could do some things. Um, and I think the messaging is going to become 
uh, very important. I was also gratified to see that here in the, Bay, the greater Bay Area, the support was much stronger than it was in Southern California. Um, and, you know, hopefully we're, uh, this turnout in the November election uh, will be better for us. We know this is a right. fairly cynical move by congressional Republicans to, uh, to increase turnout um, for their weak candidates. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it's a terrible thing to put the, the state's infrastructure um, at risk uh, because the message of, uh, of, of one party is so bad that they have to figure out uh, ways to, to goose their own members, their own party members to come out. Um, we need these funding, the Metro needs the, the funding, we need it for buses, we need it to keep on operating. Uh, it's, uh, the state needs to step up, the federal government has walked away, in my opinion, on, on, uh, on financing uh, transit. And then all of our jurisdictions obviously use this money uh, and the unincorporated parts of the county it's six to eight million dollars uh, a year, which makes a huge difference in us being able to meet the needs of our road system. So um, we'll fight hard here in Santa Cruz and try to uh, uh, lock up a lot of votes, not the transit district, but uh, those of us in office will work hard uh, to, to, to try to generate as many votes as possible here in Santa Cruz to help with the statewide effort. Appreciate that, Director Leopold, and if I might, the reference that the chair and the director made to the LA Times poll, again, they just asked, do you want your gas tax to go down? 51% yeah. of the people say, sure. When you ask follow-up questions, do you want us to fill potholes? Do you want uh, congestion relief on our highways and streets and roads? Do you want improved transit service, more buses, more light rail? We get uh, strongly support or, 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 or somewhat support in the 90s, the 80s, the 70s, depending on the question. So again, it's about the messaging, and that'll be about, uh, I'll say, the resources that the campaign has at hand. And by the way, Governor Brown, very personally involved in that too. He told me the other night uh, he's making the calls that you would expect him to be making on things like this. But it will be a campaign about uh, ideas and, and the messages uh, uh, are important and what you can all do as public officials is tell your community the pros and cons in terms of what would happen to this agency, for instance, one way or the other. Um, Thank you for your work. Uh, Director Matthews. This is just a follow-up to the general subject. Um, I'm not on RTC, if anyone here, is anyone here on RTC? Yeah, um, yeah half of you, okay. <laughs> yeah, I thought so. I thought there was a good, strong <laughs> contingent. Um, is RTC coordinating any countywide fact gathering on this i mean we can do something on metro and the cities can do something on their city roads et cetera, but a county-wide story Pardon? yes so uh, oh, what okay. gina is actually we've taken that initiative on gina's in the process of trying to coordinate representation from all of the cities in the way of city manager, public works directors, if they have a uh, chief information officer, that person. Um, our goal is in August or September to get them, preferably no later than August, to get them all into a room to talk about things about how we educate people on the importance of SB1. So as you can imagine, we have you know three months of work to do. We need to have messages like we just had continue all through that period of time. Um, we've had this big break in time now since our message got out there. So I think each, each of those entities, the cities individually in the county, can we can sort of time how they get out there and talk about what the SB1 is doing for the community. Not the campaigning stuff, yeah, just yeah. educating the voters on what the, the importance of that and what it is doing in Watsonville and Capitola, Scotts Valley, City of Santa Cruz, and and of course the county, those individual stories need to be out there for a, a solid three months. So that's the goal, August, no later than September, have them all in the room and talk about the strategy. August is too late to do that. Yeah. I agree, it's, it's very difficult to get those folks together. Oh, well, get started, I mean that's. Yeah, I know that the county is, uh, we, we're, our public information officer is, is thinking about uh, the ways to tell the story in different ways through uh, the, uh, various means, you know, it, it, it's interesting to me that now our uh, Twitter and Facebook reach mm -hmm. is greater than the Sentinel. Yeah. Um, and so we're, we're thinking about ways in which we can get stories out uh, about the effect. And of course, I know we're all doing, I'm assuming we're all doing signage um, about our projects all around uh, the community. 
uh, and I think that will be very helpful as well. Well, we got five cities in the county, and it's it's not that many jurisdictions, so yeah. it's it shouldn't be rocket science to get people together. No. So. Mr. Hagan, one of the things, Mr. Shaw, you're mentioning constantly the potholes situation. You might add to that sidewalks sure. and the thing. I'm on those sidewalks, and some of them are truly mm -hmm. destructive, especially in South County. Mm -hmm. yep. I fight it consistently. Agreed. Good point. Point well taken. Thank you, sir. Ms. Kaufman Gomez. Thank you. Uh, the the Senate Bill 1434, can you tell us a little bit more about how the overlay would work with the CCAs? So that is a great question, and given uh, the Monterey uh, uh, entity that the chair mentioned that, that he and the CEO have been talking to, we need to take a second look. This The question of CCAs explicitly has come up quite recently. As I stand here today, I'm not positive the CPUC, according to this bill, has the authority to work with CCAs. That's been asked of me quite recently in the last few days. I'm going to go back to Sacramento and talk with our folks running that bill and make sure that we've worked that in. Because presumably, uh, whether you buy your power from PG&E or a CCA, um, if the state has a mandate for zero emission buses, we'd want transit to get the same kind of rate relief. So we think we'd want that bill to have that impact. I'm not sure it does that adequately yet. Thank you. Point, good point. Any other questions? Um, thank you very much for your presentation and uh, your efforts. Um, really, I, I just know from experience uh, that you're highly respected there, and thank you for your, your in-depth knowledge of the transportation issues in the state of California and how severely they impact us. And I just want to just mention to the general public, I know they know, but this does not have any impact on Measure D that was passed mm -hmm. by voters. And thank heavens by more than two thirds, um, and uh, that was the half cent sales tax, and uh, that's safe. So uh, we just this is uh, SB one is a separate uh, entity, and so we just have to work on that. Thank, thank you, you Mr. Again. Chair. I appreciate the work of all of the directors in supporting public transit. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, now with that simpl simplified presentation of the state issues, we're going to go to the federal with uh, Mr. Chris Giglio of uh, Capital Edge. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, we do have, uh, yeah, we have a uh, pr slide presentation, I guess, right? Okay. So fancy. <laughs> Thanks very much, uh, Mr. Chair and directors. Uh, Josh usually comes with a slideshow, and I usually come <laughs> up and chat, and so I have a staff person that actually knows how to use a computer and PowerPoint, and so I said, can you put something together for me? And then Josh comes up and chats, and I got the, uh, the PowerPoint. <laughs> <laughs> I can't win with that guy. Anywho, <laughs> thanks very much for having me. Uh, I, uh, I thought I would start by talking a little bit about uh, the annual trip that, that uh, some of you folks have made over the last few years to Washington, D.C., uh, and I want to thank you. I want to thank uh, Director Dutra, Director Botdorf, and Director Rotkin uh, for coming to Washington this, uh, this April, along with the CEO. Uh, I think these trips are important to make, uh, and I think that they're effective. Uh, so, uh, and, uh, but I also wanted to go a little bit through, for those of you who haven't come, what, what we do there. Is, this is not uh, a uh, fun and games trip. Uh, it's more like a forced march. I think that's what Director <laughs> Botdorf uh, re referred to it as this year. Uh, <laughs> and uh, we visit as many people as we can uh, in, a, in a short amount of time because you folks are busy uh, back home. So anyway, uh, of course we meet with, with folks in our congressional delegation and, and, uh, and uh, a lot of times there's new staff uh, in, those new de in those delegations. So in educating them about the needs of, of Santa Cruz Metro is always something uh, that we like to do. Uh, Congressman Panetta and his staff are kind of up to date on, on our needs now and have been very helpful in the, in the short time that he's been in Congress uh, and the two senators, of course, as well. Uh, we also go to the congressional committees uh, that have jurisdiction over transportation, the appropriations committees that fund the federal transportation programs on an annual basis, the authorizing committees that, uh, uh, that do the, the big five-year policy bills that, that happen. We go and we talk to them. Another thing that we've been doing, and I think that, uh, Mr. Chairman, this was your idea a few years ago, is kind of hit other members of the California delegation, particularly those on the Transportation Committee, uh, to tell them our story. And in a lot of ways, they match up with the stories of, of those, other, those other districts. And I think that helps to, uh, you know, to make a united voice when we talk again about those big five-year policy bills. Uh, and then, of course, we go to the Department of Transportation, Federal Transit Administration, and others to, uh, to talk about their grant programs, uh, things like that. 
Of course, the, the sort of the main topic for us is our, our very long-term funding needs, which I think is important because uh, a lot of folks will come to town and they will say, all right, we need X a million dollars for our transit facility or we need X million dollars for our buses. And I think that I, I appreciate that your message uh, is, is, is more nuanced than that. We have these very long-term problems. We have, uh, we have different needs. Uh, and, and here's what we're doing to address them on the local level. It's not sort of the, you know, what some people call the tin cup uh, uh, deal where just, just give me money and trust that I'm going to use it. So uh, again, I, I appreciate that. I appreciate your commitment to doing that. And that helps me on a day-to-day -day basis when I talk to uh, congressional staff about things. They know that, that, I'm, that I'm coming from someplace uh, that is supported by, by the board of directors. So uh, the other thing we do, of course, is we advocate for our grant applications that we put in and, you know, Coincidence or not, a few weeks after that trip, we were able to uh, secure uh, some funding for, for some additional buses uh, from the bus and bus facilities. So, so I will take credit for that. And, uh, <laughs> and I, think, uh, I think that uh, that the directors who were there should also take credit for that. So uh, we'll get together after on the press release. Uh, and, then, uh, and then also talking about, we were able to talk about some of the issues that we're having with this, you know, transition to electric buses with, with the folks at FTA who are kind of on the ground and are uh, administering these programs and, and talking about the, you know, there are, there are shades of gray with regard to this, to this program and getting out. Uh, and we, we heard Josh, you know, talk about it on the state level as well with regard to these electric buses. And I think that was helpful. And then another thing, I kind of dragged you over to this new office at the, the Department of Transit. Transportation. It's a loan program called the TIFIA Loan Program. It's Transportation Innovative Financing and Infrastructure Act, something to that effect. But anyway, the way that things are going at, in, in, the, in the White House right now, I, I believe that that is going to be sort of their main avenue or vehicle for what they might call an infrastructure package. It's a loan program. Uh, the terms are very good. We went in there, and, I, and, and again, I, I appreciate your willingness to go in there and talk about it. Probably in the end, it's not going to be something that works out for us, um, but we did, you know, we did talk about it and actually gave some feedback to uh, congressional committees uh, on that and how, how this loan program might not necessarily work. Uh, for bus purchases, and uh, just a, a, a short description of it is essentially when they when the when they decide the length of that loan, they talk about the the life of the asset. And so, if you have a a, a twelve to fourteen year life of a bus, that's not you know not completely workable. And, and I I think Alec could probably talk more about that if he had questions. So uh, so again, thank you again for these trips. They work. Uh, they they get you guys are great in getting message across. And so uh, thank you again. Uh, a little bit of good news uh, since I last talked to you uh, with regard to the budget. I mean, I think that a lot of things coming out of D.C. right now are concerning um, to a lot of you. Uh, but sort of underneath the surface, uh, we're we're doing Congress is doing some decent work on on budgeting, uh, at least for the next two years. Earlier this year, the president and Congress got together uh, to essentially pass legislation that lifted some very, very tight overall spending caps for uh, fiscal years 18 and fiscal years 19. A little bit of history, I'll go back to 2011 where deficit reduction was all the rage uh, in Congress and Congress passed a, a bill called the Budget Control Act of 2011 and it set some very tight budget caps for 10 years from 2011 to 2021. Uh, much, much lower than, you know, would be increases uh, from inflation. And so now we're six or seven years into that and a lot of uh, agencies are, are, are not being able to work at it. Um, the president wanted more money for defense. Uh, Democrats in the Senate said, sure, we'll give you more money for defense, but you need to also raise uh, non-defense spending in that by that same percentage. So we have this bill that allows us uh, for some, uh, for a little bit of breathing room in FY18 and FY19. And the result has been some increases for some uh, programs under the transit uh, uh, umbrella. Uh, for instance, the Tiger Discretionary Program, a very popular um, uh, program, uh, was tripled from $500 million in FY17 to $1.5 billion in FY18. Uh, and that was actually a program that the president had recommended eliminating. So uh, that was sort of a pretty strong rebuke to the, to the president uh, from, from, in a bipartisan way from Congress. The formula programs that we saw from the 2015 FAST Act, which goes from 2015 to 2020, uh, that, 
that decides the funding levels for these formula programs. Pretty much stayed the same. Uh, we get about a 2% increase in that. But again, the competitive programs, like the bus and bus facilities program, the low and no emissions program, did receive kind of double digit percentage increases. And so we've got a little more you know, money to work with in FY18. Uh, Tom Hiltner is going to be up late nights for the next few months. All of those grant applications have come out at the same time. So uh, I feel for the guy, but he does great work. So we're, so we're looking <laughs> forward to, to putting those together. <laughs> Um, and another good, another good news with regard to this, uh, you may, if you, you may have recalled um, uh, our, our, our tale of woe back in 2012, the 2012 uh, uh, of transportation reauthorization bill called MAP 21 took that bus and bus facilities account and literally cut it in half. It was almost a billion dollars. They cut it down to below $500 million. We've been fighting ever since to get that money back in a very tough budget environment. Uh, and we are now finally kind of back, you know, um, and even exceeded those levels uh, a little bit in FY18 and FY19. So, so some good news uh, from uh, from DC. Uh, it, you know, for for a lot of agencies, it's it's been much worse. So I will say that. Uh, the way that, you know, the way that Congress has sort of been in gridlock for the last several years, we get these very compressed budget cycles where uh, the FY18 budget, which was supposed to be approved in October of 17, wasn't approved until April of 18. Uh, but now we're already stepping into FY19, which technically begins on October 1 uh, of this year. And again, uh, the numbers are not looking bad for transit. I don't think we're going to get the, you know, the high, you know, the big increases that we got in 18. Uh, but I think we'll probably stay right around the same levels, again, getting those 2% bumps uh, with regard to formula programs. We've got some issues. Actually, it's sort of a good news sort of deal. Now that we're up to this uh, billion dollar level for the bus and bus facilities account, sort of internally, transit agencies are having a discussion about how that money is spent. Right now, it's kind of split almost in half between formula grants and competitive grants. And, uh, and, there are, and now that we're at about a billion dollars, some, some are thinking that maybe all of that should go into a formula grant. If we can, you know, at a, at a very high level, we can get kind of a, a larger allocation through the formula, maybe bank that for a few years and use it for some good <coughs> capital projects. Back when we were at, a, at $400 million for this program, a formula allocation would not have been big enough uh, to do that. So we encouraged, you know, increasing that competitive uh, uh, grant pot. So, uh, so we'll have some discussions about that internally. I think the transit community uh, uh, within APTA and the bus coalition and others, and, and Alex has been uh, a leader in those discussions uh, as well. So uh, finally, uh, with FY19, uh, our, our baby, which I call it, the Small Transit Intensive Cities Program, the STIC program, is scheduled to uh, increase. Uh, right now, it is 1.5% of the larger Section 5307 formula program. It will increase to 2% of that, uh, which should probably uh, increase the pot from about $68 million in FY18 to almost $90 million, I think, if my math is right. Debbie will correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, but I think it's $90 million uh, in FY19 for this program. Uh, and given that Santa Cruz Metro has been very successful with this program, um, you know, receiving about $2 million, I think, in 18. So maybe, you know, we're getting over $2.5 million in 19 for this program. So not insignificant uh, with regard to that. And uh, we're going to keep fighting uh, for a larger percentage uh, of that pie. We're hoping to eventually get to $3 million, uh, maybe in the, in the FAST Act uh, uh, in 2020. So infrastructure and Director Leopold, you mentioned about sort of the federal government uh, and their and their uh, interest or lack of interest in infrastructure. Um, I think that uh, you know certainly you guys all know that that uh, the discussions about an infrastructure package have slowed down. The president earlier this year put out some principles that he thought he wanted in an infrastructure package. They were pretty heavy on private investment. He was thinking about two hundred million dollars of federal investment. And that's almost in existing programs. It's not even new money. Uh, and he thought that that would leverage about $800 million uh, or more in private investment to make that billion dollar package. I don't think Congress, I know that Congress is not going to take up that package in any form this year, possibly not next year either. 
Um, I think that um, uh, some, of the, some of the aspects of it are concerning on both sides of the aisle. I think both sides of the aisle want some new money in this thing. Uh, they want a little less, um, a little less focus on public-private partnerships. Uh, and it's sort of an interesting, um, an interesting coalition. There are a lot of, uh, of rural Republican senators and members of Congress who say, boy, we can't get a uh, a P3 in our in our area. It's just not you know the numbers don't don't um, add up and people don't want to invest there. So uh, with with some you know sort of urban transit oriented type of places who also say that that it's not necessarily a winner. Um, uh, a lot of people say if if a, if private <coughs> industry wanted to you know get into transit, they already would be. Uh, it would be a money maker. So, uh, so again, Congress is probably not expected to act in 18, and uh, depending on how things go in November, you know, we could see something in 19. But I, I, I have a feeling, uh, like I see here, that that what the infrastructure package is going to look like is pieces. B Congress is going to take individual programs that are already ready for reauthorization. This year, aviation programs are up for reauthorization. Water resources programs are up for reauthorization. They'll deal with those, and I would assume they'll say, "Hey, this is part of our." Our, our overall infrastructure package. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, with, with regard to the Department of Transportation, they are already sort of trying to use these existing programs to, uh, to shape, uh, to, to match up with some of their policies. So, for instance, we're seeing uh, some smaller, more widespread uh, awards uh, for some of these programs, you know, the, the low and no emissions program at DOT used to be almost, you know, almost a, a California-centric uh, program because of the mandates here, uh, but they're spreading that out more. Uh, they're, they're making uh, more awards to rural areas, rural road projects. Uh, the DOT secretary has said that safety uh, in the rural areas is a priority there, and so they're putting a lot of money there. And they're rewarding uh, folks who provide more a lot more uh, than the required match, and uh, and if and if part of that overmatch is a private um, uh, participation, all the better. Also, uh, wanted to mention, and I think I have mentioned that that the Fast Act, the five-year reauthorization bill that was approved in FY15, is going to be up again in 2020, uh, and so hopefully some real important discussions will happen in 2019 about how we fund that bill. You may recall in 2015, Congress used lots of budget gimmicks, some one-time infusion of funds to fully fund that program. Those aren't there anymore. Nobody knew. You know, I was telling someone this the other day. Um, something like $50 billion was available in a, in, a tr in, a, in, a, in a rainy day fund that the Federal Reserve had. And every committee in Congress was angry at the Transportation <laughs> Committee for finding that money, you know, and using it. Everyone's like, oh, I want, I want to use that money. But that's not there anymore. And, and the, other, the other one, the other, the other budget gimmicks on. And so we're probably going to have to have a real serious conversation about a gas tax increase, about, uh, on the federal level, uh, about using some of these other uh, vehicle miles traveled, uh, um, uh, uh, attaching some sort of fee at the refinery level to, uh, on, on, on gasoline to try to, get these you know, funding levels up to a, to a place where um, they're robust increases. Really, uh, we haven't had a significant increase in transportation funding since 2009, which was the end of the, the Safety Lou Act, they called it. We've essentially had flat funding since then. We've had little you know, increases, um, but it's essentially been flat. So we're hopeful that we can have some real discussions uh, about that. And it's going to be hard, but, uh, but hopefully right after an election, everyone can kind of lock arms and say, let's talk about this. We're far away from our next election. So. And uh, that was all I had for now. I actually, I, want, I did want to add two uh, more things that I didn't have up on here. Uh, one was that uh, given the sales tax, uh, you know, the, the sales taxes that come in here for, um, for transit and for other things, the Supreme Court decision yesterday on, uh, on online sales taxes, I think, will hopefully be of a help. Uh, uh, my understanding is what the Supreme Court did was it, it sort of remanded to a lower court to say, Yes, we you know th that uh, local governments can um, can get online retailers, out of state online retailers, to collect local sales taxes. But this lower court's going to kind of figure out how that all goes. But I hope that you know sooner rather than later, there's more revenues coming in the local level. This has been a fight that we've been having for a long time, uh, and. Uh, 
and the Supreme Court may even, you know, may even scare Congress into moving on this. And uh, so, so hopefully, again, sooner than later, we'll see some increases to, to local sales taxes. And then finally, Barrow mentioned the university's conference. Uh, I'm taking this show on the road about five miles north to the Santa Cruz Hilton on Sunday. And uh, I, uh, Barrow asked me about a month or so ago, do you have any suggestions for, um, for any sort of uh, sessions at this university's conference? And so I gave him some suggestions. And then a couple of weeks later, I get a call from Aptus saying, so I hear you doing a session at the university's conference. <laughs> And uh, the CEO said, that's what you get when you raise your hand. <laughs> Expect to be called on. So anyway, happy to do that. I think, it's, uh, I think this is going to be a great, uh, a great show for people coming from around the country to see all the great things that you guys are doing. So happy to take any questions, and thank you again for your time. Yeah, like I said about Mr. Shaw uh, and the state level, I want to thank you for your leadership and the respect that you earned in Washington, D.C. It's clear when we go back there to talk to people, uh, they, you were at the, the, you know, the front of the line about uh, being on top of transportation issues. And we appreciate it very much. It's been a, a long and a very successful relationship we have. And I, I'm very hopeful that uh, we can improve that. I guess it's just trying, uh, the battle has been just to try to stay even and hopefully we can uh, move forward. And for those, I don't know, this, this projection of what do they want, uh, the administration wanted 80% uh, private participation and you know when your fare back box revenue is 25 percent uh and this is ours uh you don't expect a lot of private enterprise to go in and get a 75 percent uh you know responsibility for something like that and uh, as an offset to that as i said in a recent uh, clip that we had you know 80 percent of our riders don't have another mode of transportation and we provide that service and they're just for the economy, but, but mostly for their own needs, uh, whether it be doctor's appointments or uh, visits of one type or another, it's just absolutely essential that uh, public transportation uh, succeed. And um, I hope this administration uh, comes to uh, realize that we need a better formula than the one that has been presented up to date. But thank you again. Um, any comments from the, the board members? Grace, you want to start? Yes. <laughs> Mr. Duke. Um, thank you for, for coming and speaking today. I know I've, I've been on the trip for the last three years, and um, it's no joke when you say it's an all-day thing. I mean, you have us up at 6 a.m. and then pass, I mean, that's 3 a.m. our time. And um, we go to bed really late, sometimes 9, 10 o'clock. So, um, but it, it, it's effective, and, and I do really see the difference between the, both administrations. I feel not that it was easier when the, the Obama administration was um, under control, but it just seemed like, I mean, that's when we got our first huge grant coming. And um, ever since, it was, it's kind of been really pulling teeth. And you've, need, you've needed Alex to go and insult the Trump administration to really <laughs> get things done. But, um, you know, I mean, it, it, we, we really, I'm not hopeful that this administration is going to see that how important transportation is. And so that I, that's why I think it's really important that we continue looking for other sources of funding because, um, I mean, just the past, you know, year, the, or the past two years have just been kind of, I just noticed the difference of it's kind of almost I, I, it's a, I know it's a term, but pulling teeth and and um, I don't think that he gets it. He doesn't understand the importance of you know eighty percent of people who using um, metro don't have any other um, forms of transportation. So um, I think we need to continue doing this. Um, I, you know, c continue going on the trips is important. I, I really do see we can see how we've been fruitful. Um, you know, all the new buses that we've been getting and, and we're hopeful in the future for other, um, you know, um, hopefully funding that we'll be getting, fingers crossed. But um, I, I want to say, you know, thank you and keep on pushing it. And, you know, we just, you know, the, the FAST Act, I mean, that seems like something that we're going to need to start working on again. And I know you're, you're in the trenches making, going to make sure that this happens and gets renewed to a, you know, plentiful um, number. <laughs> but um, thank goal. you. Uh, thanks, Press, for everything. Thank you. Uh -huh. Mr. Leopold. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, uh, thank you for your presentation, and uh, thank you for your ongoing work as someone who went on the trip last year. Uh, I know uh, what a good job you do in terms of putting us together with, uh, uh, with elected officials and decision makers, um, and I, I know that you uh, have a good relationship with those uh, members of Congress, because I have someone in at least one office who, who <laughs> likes <a> little. you. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, the, the, uh, the question, I had a couple questions. One is, although the uh, Congress um, passed the spending levels for 18 and 19, we still have to go through the process 
and we have a president who um, who keeps on threatening he's going to shut the government down. Yeah. Um, uh, you have yeah. a sense uh, about this? I mean, with the, the talk on the Hill about this? Yeah, I think there is a little bit of nervousness. You know, I think it wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't long after the president signed the legislation to increase the caps that I think somebody told him, you know, you just, you know, increased the caps. And, he <laughs> <laughs> and, and so then he said, never again, I'm never again, I'm going to do this. Uh, and so... <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I think that he, there is, there's a lot of talk from the White House about, about vetoing some of these spending bills. Uh, and, and the interesting thing is, is that it's Republican, you know, Republicans control the House and the Senate. They are moving these FY19 spending bills at a pretty good clip. They're kind of moving along with the idea that, boy, maybe we can get a budget before October 1. Um, but, uh, and so, so it'll be interesting to see that showdown between you know, Republicans controlling the Congress and presenting the president with, with a bill and whether he wants to veto it, especially given, you know, we've, we've got elections coming up. So that's, I think in the end, cooler heads will prevail and, and, you know, electoral concerns will prevent him from vetoing these bills. But I've, I've been wrong about this well, administration most of us before. Have this, uh, <laughs> so don't hold me to it. <laughs> doesn't follow the standard playbook, that's for sure. Not at all. Not um, at all. I guess the other question I had is um, uh, some predict that uh, there might be a change in um, a majority uh, in the House. Um, and should that happen, does it make things easier or do you think it makes things harder? That's a good question. I, you know, I think it. I think policy-wise, it, it maybe makes things a little easier. It may, we may get back to what con people, in, you know, people in Congress call regular order, sure. right? Where these bills are being taken up in committee and debated and then they go to the floor and they're approved and then the Senate and the House get together and they reconcile the differences. And so if we've got a Republican Senate that has, you know, ideas and we've got a democratically controlled House, that might actually, you know, we might actually start negotiating again. Now, again, you know, I think the president is a wild card in all of this. Sure. Uh, so, uh, but, I, but I think it could be a good thing. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm just amazed at the number of pieces of legislation where one side isn't even talked to, right? The Democrats aren't, they don't even talk to them, and then the president criticizes the party, says, why don't, why don't they come to the table? They're not even, they don't even get the address of the meeting. Right. So, uh, <laughs> come to the table. So right. um, uh, anyway, I, I think that uh, we have a lot riding in these uh, November elections. Uh, uh, hopefully they get the budget done before then. I think that would be helpful. Yeah. Um, and maybe uh, after the election, uh, that it provides a small window of time to really do the, the bipartisan work necessary um, uh, uh, to do things like the FAST Act. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what we need. Uh, and uh, I just um, uh, appreciate that our CEO insulted the, the administration. Uh, <laughs> the people of Th Santa Cruz, thank you. <laughs> and I just appreciate your ongoing work. I, I know you work hard for us, so thank you for that. Thank you very much. Yeah, Mr. Bothurst. Yeah, I, I just want to chime in and so support uh, Commissioner Dutra here. Uh, thank you for the well-planned and organized trip that you put on. It was my first time back there, and, and we covered pretty much all the bases that, that I think were necessary. And the fact that we brought home some fruit from that trip, uh, I think we should all commend you and, and ourselves for a great effort. And just want to acknowledge and appreciate what you do. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes, Mr. Hagan. Yes, I just would like to reiterate some of the things that they are saying. <laughs> because I'm coming from a point of view of a lot of men and we women in Watsonville that I've lived in for now some 55 years. They're vibrant. We used to be vibrant and functional. Well, it's hard for many of them. Metro is their only means of functioning in the city. And I see them all the time. Sometimes they're in tears because they have to get there. And can they? Well, thanks to Mr. Clifford and the staff, yeah, we can get there. And from my perspective, thank you for my heartfelt thanks to provide me and help provide me with a way of life. Thank you. Thank you for saying that. And, and, that, and it means a lot, you know, to hear these, the, the personal stories. And I know all of them, but I know Director Dutra, when he comes, he, he makes impassioned pleas 
uh, on behalf of his community and, and those who, who need it. So uh, thank you very much. Any other comments from the board? I might, uh, I don't know if, um, I didn't ask the public if they had any comments. Uh, it's um, complicated, There's, it's uh, very intense at state, at Sacramento and Washington, D.C. Okay, I think we're fine, but thank you for your presentation. And your, your slides were perfect. Were they all right? <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, right. All right, I'll report you that back to him. Yeah. <laughs> Shake it Thank up a little bit. That's good. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we will go now to uh, a public hearing on item number 17. It's uh, the annual budget for fiscal year 19, 18, 19. Uh, we have discussed this in some detail a couple times before, but uh, our finance man manager, sure. Angela Aiken, will be presenting this in just one second. Good morning. So you've been listening to the federal pieces and the um, state pieces for the last hour-ish. Um, all, everything that they just said is, has in some way been incorporated into the budget, uh, whether it was a positive to the revenue, a threat to our revenue, or something else that is going in our, into our budget over the next five years. Um, in the interest of time, I will ask the board what they would like me to do. I can go over the changes just verbally of what has changed uh, between me and now. Maybe I should ask, is, um, since your, other, your former presentation, so has there been any, um, any shift of any magnitude that we should be? It doesn't look like that, but I mean, everything is pretty much just, uh, as you presented earlier. Is that correct? A couple of things have changed. So we've added in... Um, we were unable to get to our finance committee with our management comp plan numbers at the time of the, that we could get the finance committee together, but we felt it important to put some kind of budget number into the FY1920 budget. So that budget number is in here. It has not gone through the finance committee, nor has it been approved per se, but I just want to make sure you know it's a budget number. It's not what we are actually going to do at this point. So we did put about $400,000 in each year for 19 and 20 on the expense side for the management comp plan for right now. Um, we also talked about the medical plan. Uh, last month I told you that we had preliminary numbers the day before our board meeting in May, and they were somewhere between 18 and 25 percent. Thank goodness that's come down. We're seeing about a 7 percent increase. So we have five in the budget right now. And so um, yeah. if you do, it's, it's only six months that it would go up for this year because those numbers won't come out till January. So we have 5% in the budget right now. We're anticipating about a 7% increase. So we feel comfortable with what we have in the budget on that. Okay. And then the other revenue pieces, the positive pieces, we have some extra money coming in on the 5307 money. That's about 40,000 a year. We have extra stick money coming in. That's about 80 to $90,000 a year. And then in 2020, we have another $70,000 coming in on SDA money. So those are my big pieces. Um, on the expense side, besides the management comp plan, we have two $10,000 things that came through website testing that we put into the IT area, and then another $10,000 to keep planning going with their um, ridership uh, surveys. There we go, <laughs> the ridership surveys. Okay. So those are the big pieces that changed. Otherwise, um, everything else is as it is. Uh, we have six positions in there right now that we are delaying until January because of the SB1 threat that we have going on right now. Uh, the day after that uh, vote is taken, if it comes out as a positive for us where it is not rescinded, HR is going to be very busy trying to hire six people. Very good. What's the best on that? Uh, Mr. Leopold. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, uh, I've had a chance to review this and was part of the, the, the committee. Uh, one thing that, that uh, in a presentation this week uh, at the Board of Supervisors during our budget hearing was just the leveling off of the sales tax numbers. And, uh, you know, that's what they've seen. Um, and we, so... We have not. <laughs> uh, our sales tax numbers as of the end of May, we are eight, uh, six percent over last year. And so we only put two and a half percent in there. Uh, we have budget to budget going forward into next year. We put an eight percent increase. Budget to budget, not actual. So our budget last year to what we put in this year, we've increased it by 8%. But going forward into 20, I think we've only put a 3% increase in there. Sure. Um, and uh, maybe this is a, a question less for you and more for Mr. Clifford. Uh, the, the, uh, the FTE that we would be adding um, to our drivers, um, where do we see that, 
driver being, assuming SB1 doesn't get repealed and we can hire that driver, where do we see that driver uh, uh, performing at their routes? Sure, and, and I'm going to punt to Mr. Emerson to tell us a little bit about their preliminary thoughts on that. Thank you, and real quickly, we had had this in our report back in May. Uh, the assumed priority for the next resource we would get would be somewhere geographically in the San Lorenzo Valley, Scotts Valley area, and I think I told you we were looking at different approaches to Scotts Valley Drive. Mike Paisano mentioned the future opportunity up at Borland. And then the other thing is up the San Lorenzo Valley, our frequency f among those legs up the valley is so poor, it's almost unusable. So that was the general vicinity. Well, I appreciate the concerns about frequency, and I do. Uh, and uh, to, to my colleagues who represent the area, I don't, I don't mean to detract from the needs up there, but I think we do have to start planning um, for uh, increased frequency uh, in the mid-county area. I mean, when you look at where the density is and where we propose the density, we're proposing on Capitola Road 60 units of affordable housing, a new 20,000 square foot health <coughs> clinic, a new 10,000 square foot. Um, a dental clinic on Capitola Road. We need service there, um, and uh, we have got to start planning to to put that ser service there uh, and to add a driver. And um, I, I'm not uh, I, I'm not um, asking in this year's uh, budget, but but in when we when we know what the results are from November, uh, which I hope will mean that the SB1 money doesn't go away. I, all bets are off after that. But assuming that that, that 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 does not get repealed, we need to start planning for that uh, uh, increased frequency because it's a it's the most urbanized part of the uh, of the uh, unincorporated area. Um, it, it in all intents and purposes functions like a city. The density of people living there is much greater, and um, and we are we are building and plan to build lots more uh, along those routes. And so we really need the service. So uh, uh, um, I will ask to come back in January to sort of start figuring out how we can uh, start planning for that. Yeah, two real quick things there. I really appreciated Jarrett Walker coming to town and reinforcing that because we've always had a longer list than just the thing at the top of the list. But one other nuance I'd like to add because I, I bored you to death two years ago with coverage, span of service, frequency. But interestingly, in the mid-county area, frequency is an obvious one to all of us but we actually need a bit more span of service, and I don't mean midnight. I'm talking about getting to 8, 9, 10 o'clock yeah. because of the economy here is not a 9 to 5 economy. So it's not, it's not as dramatic or as sexy to extend the bus another two trips for another two hours, but it starts to make it a viable option for those people who are trying to get to it. So those are on our list, and I'm looking forward to that opportunity of sharing all that with you. Yeah, I think it will be su super helpful, and I look forward to continuing d discussing it. I know w we're limited, and we shouldn't take on too much until we know uh, this big funding source, what's going to happen, but we have to start planning. Mr. Hagan? Yes, sir. Vera, years ago, you and I conversed about the necessity, even though, yes, I know it's minor, the number of people needing it, but you, are you still going to maintain the idea the basic one or two service rides a week for even these very low rider areas? Well, that will be the tough one. And, and I think uh, sort of following on from Jared's presentation, I think we're going to start showing you the way we see, is it coverage or pursuit of ridership that the various routes are trying to do? And let's be clear, some are there for coverage and some are chasing ridership. So I'm looking forward through our strategic planning process in the fall to bring that stuff back up. Thank you. And maybe if I can just jump onto that a little bit. Um, Director Leopold asked if I could explore Jared coming back to our community um, in appreciation of the fact that not all of our board members are on the RTC and only the RTC saw his presentation. And as you know, his presentation challenges you. Uh, it, it challenges you in a number of respects, but one of his key points is uh, geographic coverage versus frequency. And, and so, uh, you know, this is a challenge that boards across the nation face. Everybody pays taxes and, and uh, there is partisan politics involved and you try to spread the service out as much as you can, but it's not always the right way to run a system. 
uh, and everybody in the county benefits even if the bus doesn't stop in front of their house. So I think there's good things that he presents that, that our board should hear, those members that were not uh, uh, on the RTC when he presented. Uh, Barrow's done some preliminary exploration. It looks like he might be available in August, which is, I think as Director Leopold was suggesting, would be a good time because likely our strategic plan workshop with the board will happen, I think, Gina, what do you think, September-ish is what we're shooting for? So if we could do that in advance, it might bring um, to bear in the strategic workshop some discussion mm -hmm. about um, geographic coverage versus uh, frequency and some of the things that you learned from Jared Walker. Yeah, I, mean, I, I, think I, I thought he gave a very good uh, presentation. Uh, maybe just a show of hands, who saw his presentation? I watched the tape of it. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So about half of us did. Yeah. Um, uh, but I think focusing um, on uh, on the needs of our district m might be illuminating. I know he's also worked with the VTA and some other surrounding districts and districts throughout uh, California. Right. So I, I, I would encourage that. We, we, we think differently about about things. We, we have to shift our thinking. I mean, clearly something is happening across the nation where ridership is decreasing, and we must do something other than just stick our head in the sand. Right. Ms. Lind? Yeah, and just a thank you on the SLV, even though that's not my jurisdiction. I did with uh, Supervisor McPherson assist at the senior center with the uh, meal service and talked to some of the people that were actually walking, seniors walking down Highway 9 to be able to get to functions. And I can't even imagine how they do that and live. Um, but their, um, the stories they shared made me realize how um, lacking the, the rider, you know, the, the routes, they're just very little service, as you said, almost unusable because they just can't get to functions. So, um, it was an eye opener having that conversation and, and appreciate that attention because I think they feel they're um, not noticed. So, thank you. Thank you. Ms. Kaufman Gomez. Thank you. Um, one comment that isn't really about a financial issue. I think we'll see an impact in terms of ridership as we're seeing the increase in the gas costs um, as a result of SB1. So, um, let's wait for us to really see how that flushes out and um, how that does impact our ridership. Nonetheless, I know this is a finance budget item. Um, and my, my question concern is I did send out um, an email uh, uh, regarding our, our CalPERS situation and the request for us to have this, uh, uh, the actuary um, line itemed out so that we can really carefully monitor what's going on there on our responsibilities of, of that debt obligation. So if I can make sure that we have that separated out so it's very clear and um, how that compares with um, what I did send out that came from the state on CalPERS. We, we've added that to the collection of information that we have ongoing right now. Uh, at your request, uh, you asked us to dig deeper into this and bring back a presentation. Um, what I've indicated right now is that's probably August, September, probably more like September. Um, there is a lot of information to collect to be responsive to your request and we just want to make sure we do it right. On, on that, I know um, many of the jurisdictions are making that uh, early payment before July, uh, the end of July, and savings of interest. I wondered if that's something that we are looking at as well. Not, not, not this time. Okay. I know for even Scotts Valley, which would be smaller, it, it, it represented a, almost a $50,000 savings by making that early cash payment. So. And it has to be done, I think, by July 29th. So, well, that, on that topic, do you do internal borrowing from one fund to another? That's something you do. If you have reserves that you're not going to need in the near future, borrow short term and then pay right. back. We do not That's borrow. Really in no, we do not oh, borrow. Something. <coughs> what we because we did not have our reserves funded. What we've been focusing on is number one, getting buses on the street. And number two, seeing whatever we have left to fund our reserves. Um, and the charts that I showed you in May, and they still show in June, if you decide to take the residual out of FY18 when we close out the books in October-ish, um, you have the op opportunity to put that money in the reserves against equipment, against buses, whatever you want to do with that. Okay. 
um, this is a public hearing. Is there anybody from the public that would like to address us on our fiscal 18-19 budget? Seeing none, let's, uh, yes, Mr. Leopold. Um, uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I want to uh, credit the staff for putting this together. Um, I think that the hard work that, that the staff, the board, and the community did to help write the financial ship um, has paid off. When you look at uh, where we are financially, <laughs> Uh, where our reserves are, um, you know, we had a goal uh, just a few short years ago that in some ways seemed very difficult, um, that we, 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 had a, we had a list of things that we wanted to get funding from um, because we had a long-term goal of, uh, uh, of returning the Metro to a, uh, to a stronger financial position. And through a lot of hard work, difficult choices, um, and the support of the community, we were able to do that. And I think this budget reflects that. And it's, it's, it reminds us again about SB1 that um, part of that success is based, is hinges on the continued support from SB1. And we're all gonna be challenged in our, our, our uh, the whole Metro family and the community as a whole will be challenged to keep that funding in order to, for us to be successful into the future. So uh, I would move the recommended actions I'd ask for a report back in January to talk about the uh, the the, uh, the needs in the mid county. I'll second. Second that. Okay. A motion to second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? So ordered unanimously. Thank you very Thank you. much. Debbie Kinsel and Christina are the two that make all this information possible for me to talk to you guys. So they're the ones <laughs> behind you. it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, item number eight. I think we've already had that. <laughs> We've already had that report from the, the semi-annual report from the MAC. Uh, I don't think there's any other. Uh, we'll move to uh, item number 19, uh, consider the opening of public comment period on the proposed elimination of routes 33 and 4 due to low ridership. Uh, Mr. Barrow Emerson. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair, Board, staff, and public. Uh, this item is to open a public comment period between now and the August 24th board meeting when we would have an actual public hearing on the staff recommendation to eliminate these two low performing routes and reallocate the operator and vehicle resources to other routes. If you'll remember back two years, it, as was just said, it's hard to remember we were sitting in June of 16. But if you remember during the COA, the service analysis, which concluded with the fall 16 service reduction, these two routes, were the least cost effective and efficient routes in the system, but we wanted to give them an opportunity to thrive. We've been working them, we've been monitoring them, and it's two years later, and they're just stable. They are, they have the audience they have, and it's a really small number in terms of fixed route transit. Metro has worked very closely with Director McPherson and the San Lorenzo Valley School District to try to develop a stronger ridership for these two routes, which really only consist of one morning and one afternoon trip for each of the two routes moving through different parts of the valley. And, and, and in reality, they are primarily serving the commute to the SLV school campus. So during the last two years, these routes have continued to have the lowest per trip ridership in the system. So staff is recommending that the resources be reallocated to currently productive routes, which currently are in need of additional span of service or frequency to meet capacity needs. So if the board supports the staff recommendation, we will continue to provide the service all through the fall semester. So even if we eliminate it, it will be there for one more semester, which allows time for the school district and the local community to develop more appropriate transportation solutions to address this small scale need. That's the extent of my presentation. Thank you. Yeah, this is a, a tough call and no question for me. That's, uh, but uh, we are not a school bus uh, transporter, if you will. Uh, we have been in discussions with the school district and um, it's just um, something that we, we've discussed and uh, we're giving them ample time to try to respond adequately. And uh, uh, it's um, a situation that we're gonna serve the most people we can with the services that we have, the funds to provide that service. Are there any questions that you might have? So come back for a public hearing on in August. Thank you very much. Um, we need the motion. Oh, to oh,
I guess we need to send the, yeah, to set the public hearing uh, for. Uh, the, the resolution yeah. attached is yes. probably your action. Yes, I'm sorry, yes. Uh, I apologize. I'll, I'll move is, the there, is there any public oh. comment on this? Oh, no, John's coming. Oh, um, wait, it, it's still good morning, directors. Um, I'm John Doherty, and I just wanted to, to share a bit of information because part of my Metro work is reaching out to the senior and disability communities, and I did have occasion that to the seniors commission to let them know that this was in place and to share information about this agenda item. So I, I just wanted to share first of all that um, a senior commission member, Carol Childers was here hoping to speak to this item but she had to leave about 15 minutes ago because some ne seniors needed their lunch in the valley. So she had to leave. Also just a, a couple of just a couple questions. Um, in the past, this service to South Felton and Lompico has been kept active, you know, and also it's been a way for people to access our Metro Paracruise service. And we've even had the Paracruise, you know, available there even in the summer when routes didn't run. So I guess my question finally is if these were cut, this, wouldn't this also um, remove um, a number of people from the Metro Paracruise service area if you're looking at alternatives for service? And also, um, I wondered because I saw in, our, in the board packet, while we're spending up to, a, if I read right in the consent agenda, $100,000 to have um, people do onboard surveys, we don't um, necessarily have our own transit surveyor and our own Kind of steady stream of data. So, um, I mean, how do we? How are we able to judge ridership? So, to recover this, how are we judging ridership with our resources, and um, how would this affect um, persons who might be served now by Metro Paracruise? Thank you. Good, Carol. Do you want to answer? Well, I think we I want to do it at the public. You do. You, I, is there anybody else that would maybe maybe anybody else that would like to address this from the public? Uh, Mr. Clifford, did, did you have a comment on that? Well, I think I can have Barrow talk about uh, how we've uh, determined what the ridership is. I, I believe we've done a number of checks. He can comment on that. Um, as the board is aware, federal law requires us to have complementary service to our fixed route service. So if we pull back fixed route, you would pull back your uh, paratransit service because you wouldn't have a complementary obligation at that point. Just very quickly, and this actually ties to one of the consent items today, we have interns and temps who go out and ride buses and count ons and offs. And because of this pending situation, we've been hitting those two routes four times or three times a year because of school. So we've been monitoring it directly on through. But I just wanted to tie that to another action today. As you know, through the CTC, we've been awarded a grant to pursue AVL, automatic vehicle locator, which also includes automatic passenger counting. We will still need to have manual surveys done for the first few years of that. It's kind of a requirement of the feds when you bring in your AVL. You sort of got to calibrate it by having real people out there counting. But this will move our sophistication of our planning analysis from random surveys, 105 a year, to 100%. So in future years, when we have an opinion about something, it's going to be even stronger. How many, if any, um, people will be affected by the uh, per, per, per cruise? Um, Mm, I don't know how to articulate that number. We'll, we'll do some information gathering before this comes back to you on that. Okay, thank you. Any other comments from the public? Okay, we had, uh, entertain a motion to set, uh, or the resolution to set the, the hearing uh, for August. Motion to move. Second. Moved and second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Carries unanimously. Uh, now we have uh, the monthly financial report. Ms. Aiken again. <coughs> I will 
will try to make this brief today. All good news. Alrighty, so we're going to go over the financials as as of June thirtieth. Yes. Okay. So for the month of June, I think last month I told you we had done a kind of a sweep of STA money that we had put into the capital uh, budget, and that's why uh, it was a negative last month, and it is a negative this month. We do that once a quarter, so every once in a while you're going to see that we are negative for the month for our revenue. That's not a bad thing. Here's year to date. We're actually in a very favorable area. We're about $2 million to the good right now through actual through um, April. We have our lower, for, on the fringe benefit side, our workers' comp is lower. Our overtime is, is over, but when you put all three of those together, the regular the overtime and the benefits, it does come out to a positive number. That's what you see here. Moving on to our revenue variance. This is the ridership is still a little lower than what we budgeted. Uh, the BOE last month decided to uh, pay us differently. <laughs> so we are showing behind in April, but I will tell you by the time we get down to June, we will be more revenue than we budgeted. But they changed how they were giving out their payments, and that's why you're seeing uh, behind as of April. But that is not the true story for the rest of the year. Ads and interest are up. You see SC Arctic buses, that's what that 63000 is on other operating assistance. And then we have the quarterly transfers of the STA. That's why our STA is over right now. Just get a lump sum every quarter. Going on to the expense side, here's the budget versus actual on the expense side. We have our labor. Like I said, we're saving on labor. We're over time. We're spending more. But when you put those first three columns together, we're about $500,000 to the good, saving on that, as well as the services, mobile materials, and other expenses. Uh, settlement costs on the last end, we haven't incurred as many settlement costs. And on the services, we have uh, professional technical contracts that we haven't fully um, expensed yet. On to the capital budget. This is our spending to date through April 30th. Uh, we spent about 12% of the capital budget that was put into place. On, here's the projects that we have spent on those. Construction projects, IT projects. We got new servers. Everybody is very happy with the new servers. Uh, we have gotten a significant amount of new vehicles as well as equipment. So you can see there, new um, relief vehicles as well as we got a new lift bucket truck. That's one of the new things I have on the non-revenue vehicle piece. And this is the big one. Landscaping in Watsonville, that's the facility one on the bottom. Those are the new ones. Additional information, the unemployment was a year ago 6.9, and in this year, April, it was down to 5.4, and we're seeing a continuing trend down. Gasoline prices were a little bit higher by about 60 cents. Our ridership, pretty steady from last year, not too much variance on the fixed route as well as the total. And then on the Highway 17 the high, and Cabrillo College, reflecting just about the same. So if we go through uh, May 30th, this is my preliminary guess of what we're going to end up with at the end of May. Mm. We are at a favorable variance of about 2.2, looking at about $2 million at the end of April. We're looking at uh, about 2.2 .2 at the end of May. 56% uh, of those expenses is personnel, and 44% of the expenses are non-personnel. And then the last thing is the non-controllable budget risk. This is the same as I've been saying for many months and what um, um, Josh was saying also. This is the SB1 threat that we still have out there. Uh, it's around $3 million in 19. 18, we're good. 19, it's going to be about $3 million if that thing is rescinded. Questions? <coughs> Questions from the board? Oh, uh, Ms. Kaufman, go miss. Yes, thank you. Um, you said the labor over time, 1.15, is due to vacant positions and extended leave of absence. How many leave of absence do we have? A lot. And do, do we have any possibility of them doing some sort of um, modified duty for anything that could be still useful for the agency? 
It's something that's come up. Um, we're having discussions with HR as to something that we could put in place. Um, we've had a couple instances where we might have been able to do that, but, but because we don't have a policy in place right now, um, but we are talking about that. So there's return to work kind of philosophies, I think is what you're touching on. Um, there is a general thought, um, not just in our industry, but I think virtually everywhere, that the sooner you can get somebody back to work, the, the sooner they'll come back into their original position. And so that's why you, you try to create these transitional duty kind of uh, opportunities. HR is definitely looking at that. The, the question of whether it will impact overtime, probably not. Uh, it, unless we can get them back to work sooner and not have those vacancies yeah, cause you, You've got a bucket of, in there, so if that's the case, maybe separate out uh, the ones that are on um, the disability versus the one uh, the vacancies because of overtime. Um, so if they're going to be bucketed that way, I guess that's just how I look at it. I, I may be able to do one even better. We're, we're working on a key performance indicator that'll give you some idea of absenteeism and the different parts of absenteeism. I, I think it's important for the board to see that. It is really high. Yeah, and compare and contrast with other um, trans bus service agencies and what what are they doing to remedy maybe this is an issue or I, I don't know if it has to do with contract negotiations um, and have offering some flexibility, but I, I would certainly like to have some more conversation and um, presentation material about what we can do about that. Um, that that matter here the, the, just in short the the largest contributor in my opinion is your protected leaves um, protected leaves for state and federal can't do anything about that other than to make sure you're managing your programs to the law and and we're doing a great deal of work in that that area uh, another one of those is the things that are negotiated in the contract which are the the sick leave and the annual leaves that employees have, and they have, you've given it to them, they have a right to use it, right? And, and then there are um, other leaves that are the ones that disrupt the service in a big way, which are the unplanned uh, types of things that occur that are not necessarily protected leaves. Chase? Yeah, I appreciate Director Kaufman Goman's <coughs> questions, and I'm happy to hear that the HR department is looking at this. I work at the jail, and so uh, we have a 24-hour you know, day operations. Uh, we never close. So we have a lot of things uh, related to this and have gotten creative about how to uh, encourage folks to come back to work, which has helped with the bottom line. So I think it's great that HR is looking at that, and I'm looking forward to seeing uh, what comes forward. Okay. Any other questions from the board? Any other questions from the general public? And, uh, we need a motion to accept and file. I'll move to report. accept and file. Second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? This is unanimously. Uh, item number 21, to approve a consideration of the amended drug and alcohol testing policy and approval of the resolution regarding this action. Uh, Jolene Church, our human resources manager. Good morning. Jolene Church, HR manager. And today I have for you the amendment to our current drug and alcohol testing policy, which um, puts in our mandated changes DOT to include the testing of opioids. And so all of the language um, basically comes directly from the, the mandate, um, revising and amending our current policy to include that testing. Questions? Wait, questions from the board? Uh, Ms. Kaufman, go ahead. Sure. Um, why, why was the, uh, the, I guess there's like a formula table on that exhibit, it was completely eliminated. Was this I mean, no policies are putting this into play any longer? No, Is the, yes, I see what you're saying. The um, attachment three that has been uh, omitted that you see the redlining of, that's just a fact sheet and it's more a training document. We, we have to train all of our uh, folks who are safety sensitive and so this is something that they would receive in uh, part of their training documents, and we didn't feel that it was necessary to be in a policy. It's it's better suited in a training document. And, and then the um, the cannabis uh, marijuana interchangeable. I, I didn't see a whole lot of language in there, but um, it, when the exhibit was removed, there was very little language left on that one. And my assumption is that that's it's very difficult that you just can't breathalyze for it, that kind of thing. And I, I don't know how that really plays out in policy if there's, you know, for the medicinal purposes of it. Um, I, I mean, I, 
the overall is if you're ever tested for it, then you're you're put on a leave. Right. So so these uh, all of the um, the drugs listed on the DOT's um, drug testing requirements, um, our language identically matches um, what the DOT requirement is um, for the various levels of testing, um, and um, and and so we're in alignment in in all of those. Thank you. Any other questions, oh, Mr. Leopold? Uh, thank you. Um, it says in the document that, that that these change in the policies were reviewed and discussed with our constituent unions, mm -hmm. uh, but it doesn't say they agreed or I mean they're not here uh, or maybe they'll speak. Yes. Uh, but I'm just wondering. Yes. Um, what does that mean, reviewed and discussed? Sure. After we do um, our revisions, uh, we present a 10-day notice to each of our unions, and then we schedule a sit-down. Um, typically, it is a um, would you like to discuss, or is a sit-down necessary to go over any additional information, hear your concerns, um, do you need additional information? And so we schedule a sit-down if requested, and um, so we we went and we sat down with both SEIU and uh, with UTU and went through the document and all of the changes and, and got their buy-in on both of these, or from both of the unions, I'm sorry. Was there concerns raised? Uh, that's what I'm trying to. No, um, same questions. Uh, why is attachment, the, the attachment redlined out? Um, another question was in regards to, on the very back, you'll see the, list of safe, safety sensitive job classifications by title those now match the board approved titles those were really the only the only questions because um, what we presented to them was that actual regulation um, when we present the the information we try to give them the law that actually changed and so we gave them that that CFR to review thank you for sharing that with me mm -hmm. any other questions from the board any questions from the public? Seeing none, um, entertain a motion to I'll accept. Move. <coughs> I'll move this forward. Second. second. Move and second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Carries unanimously. Uh, item number 22, uh, to consider the adoption of Santa Cruz Metro's amended conflict of interest code and approval of the resolution confirming this action. Uh, our general counsel, Julie Sherman. Thank you. Uh, so every couple of years, every public agency in California has to review its conflict of interest code. That's, that's basically what this is. This was my first chance to do it as your new, your new general counsel. Um, I took the opportunity to change your code to the FPPC model code um, just because yours had never been updated to that code. It came out a few years ago. It's not mandatory, but the FPPC, you know, basically strongly recommends that code. It just makes the review easier for that body. So I went ahead and did that. And then, um, so that was not a substantive change. Um, but then the substantive changes, which were really not all that substantive, were just updating the job position titles that had come out of the class, the management class study and taking titles away if positions are no longer at Metro, and just making sure that your list of designated positions is um, you know, up to date and that everybody who should be filing a Form 700 is. Thank you. Seems to be reasonable. Any comments from the board? Uh, Bruce, oh, just yes, one. Yes, um, Ms. Matthews. Since it's specified, um, if we add new positions that are required to be covered, is there a reference in the language that incorporates those automatic, you know where I'm going with this? Or do we yes. have to do a there should You know, sometimes be. you just, represent, uh, you, you just refer, reference any future changes. Yeah, I mean, we have to file a, a new positions form uh -huh. with the FPPC, um, so we do that. I don't think we have a particular, oh yeah, we do, of course we do, I forgot. Uh, if you look in the Appendix A in the, um, the designated positions list, the very last position is consultants and new positions. Got it. 
Yeah. Yep, it's there. <laughs> yeah, thank you. It's a good point. Yeah, uh, Mr. Leopold. I just want to add that, it, 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 as with the previous item, it's really half the easier to, to look at this with the strike through and the red. And mm -hmm. I just appreciate yeah. having that. It gives us a good idea of what's changing or not. Yeah, the one assessment. time we forgot to put it in, and now I'm I'll never forget again. So. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do that again. Any comments from the public? Okay, so I entertain a motion to approve. I move approval of the recommended second. Action. Approved and seconded. Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? So ordered. Uh, item number 23, to consider authorization of the procurement of an intelligent transportation system, or ITS. Mr. Isaac Holly, our IT manager. Good morning Welcome. still, for a little bit yes. longer. Um, so I'm very pleased to be able to present this. It is very exciting. It's something I think we've all been wanting for some time. And the reason it's exciting is because the, this is a tangible benefit to the community. Um, that is an intelligent <coughs> transportation system. And within that system, there are multiple subcomponents. Uh, the first of which is AVL, and that's the one that we've been hearing the, the same refrain, we want AVL. And the reason that's exciting is because it's a, uh, there's a customer facing component, a where's my bus application. You get a real time, uh, a real time sense of where is my bus, arrival, departure. In addition to that, there is data valuable data, essential data that we've been hearing again and again. We need this data to make better planning decisions. And there's a safety component to it as well. Uh, <clears throat> in addition to that, there's an audio visual enunciation system. We are presently equipped with Talking Bus, or what we've come to know as Talking Bus. And uh, it is, we implemented it back in 2002, so it's high time that we re replace that. It's an ADA mandated component. And uh, lastly, APC. Now, this is what we would option into our, uh, into our specification. We want it, but there are some budgetary constraints, so we want to uh, we'll make that the lower priority of these three items. So this would be funded from a CTC grant that was uh, awarded in the, on the 22nd of March in the amount of $1.4 million. And uh, we have a local match from STA in the amount of $181,385. <clears throat> So uh, again, very excited about this opportunity and I hope everybody is as well. Uh, and this concludes my presentation. Any questions or comments? Thank you for your work and this is gonna be a terrific addition. Um, just, been building a spec for a long time. Yes, right. Mr. Clifford <laughs> has been uh, it's really adamant about this. Uh, and and, and this funding from the CTC is actually SB1 money, yes. right? I mean, yes. th this has been an improvement that we've uh, uh, been uh, eyeing for a long time, but because of the cost was out of the reach. So the fact that SB1 passed and there was money to, to do this, which is critical for uh, our system, is really yeah, great we were, news. Yeah, we were eyeing the PTIM, uh, PTMISCA, and fortunately, the CTC came through. Yeah, well, I know it, it, uh, I, was, I know I we were very pleased with the award and, and everything, but it's uh, th this is great that we're going to be moving forward. Thank very excited work. It. And, Ms. Matthews. and just a, a quick question on uh, process and timeline moving forward. Well, uh, I spoke to our grants analyst, uh, Tom Hiltner. Uh, so the CTC awarded on the 22nd, and then there's a final approval in late August. We want to make, uh, it was recommended that we would start procurement in early August to get moving on this, and then uh, we would have an award of final funding. But we're going to move on this very quickly. Till it actually as, happens. Okay, so the overall timeline would be probably the first quarter of next year. Okay. We want to move very quickly on this. I've been, it's been like torture that this is the last item because I am so excited about this. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, I can't wait. Um, this is a game changer and we've been asking about this and encouraging this as a board for a really long time and, and I would say as the huge... Um, part of being um, part of the comprehensive operational analysis that we worked through with um, Mr. Emerson was that people really wanted to know when their bus was coming and a huge part of ridership was dependent upon um, knowing when the bus would get there. So I really think this is huge. It's a great step forward. We've been hearing a lot in the city of Santa Cruz, um, even when it's not on our agenda, folks keep coming and saying, do everything you can for transit. We want it. <laughs> it's, it's kind of a constant uh, drumbeat. So I think this is going to be a real uh, important 
improvement to the system and overall ridership. And I think we should do, we should just keep the uh, media and press push coverage on Metro and all the things that we're doing to increase ridership. And I think this is gonna be a really big, uh, important change for us. Yes, Mr. Dutra. I just wanted to comment on that as well. I think that this is something that we've been waiting for for a long time and we're now welcome to the new age, which is great. Um, but I also wanted to make a comment that we should probably make some sort of, you know, this is SB1 money has been used in this. I mean, this um, this is something that we can really use to our benefit to show the public that this is this money that we're getting through SB1 is 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 really going to affect your lives. And with that money gone, could really, you know, be do the opposite. So whatever we can do to use this project, maybe you said in August we're getting the award, or it'll be like confirmed late August. Late August. Confirmed, yeah. So maybe time, you know, time it correctly um, you know around the election so that um, we can really uh, you know try to you know show the public that it is doing a lot of good for us Absolutely. and there's one last thing I didn't mention and there's a safety component to this um, our new uh, risk manager Chanel is very excited about the AVL component he's been, he's worked in other um, other transportation uh, companies and it's been a boon for uh, from a safety perspective as well um, thank you. It's a matter of the, the question being the rollout with uh, the clients using the service. I mean, we're assuming that it just smartphone based. So those that don't have a smartphone, this won't be an option available to them. Um, it's, it's really what I'm assuming there. And then the, uh, the how are we promoting it to them to get it, their apps put on their phones so that they know that this service is available to them? Well, there would be uh, an outreach, and it wouldn't just be mobile uh, mobile applications. There would be desktop applications. In addition, uh, a lot of these systems are capable of providing text, so that if a person does not have a smartphone, they can still receive text uh, information, very much like our uh, Schedule by Stop app that we have now through our uh, Gov Delivery or Granicus Gov Delivery system. Okay. So I, have, I have one more thing too. The other really important part of this is it's going to really in, uh, improve our data collection process so that we can use that for all of our decision making, our budgetary decisions. I mean, like really we should be cheering and screaming. This is yeah, really, right. really, <laughs> really <laughs> big <laughs> deal. <laughs> like, why are we not are more excited, excited about now? this? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I mean, there's the just, yes. <laughs> yes. Absolutely. There's yeah. just so many things that are great about this that impact pretty much all of the items that we discussed today. This is going to help us be more competitive for all those grants that poor Tom is going to be writing. I mean, it's going to improve ridership. It, it really, I'm, I'm just so He's been making about very this. heroic efforts. Yeah. So very appreciated. Okay. Mr. Yes. Hagan. I'm sitting here thinking, this is fabulous. Pull your microphone up. I'm sitting here thinking, yes, this is fabulous. But remember, a lot of the riders on the buses are my age and older. Now, we've got to do something to educate these people because... You'll see, they got the cell phone that's sitting in front of them, and you see them on it all the time in all the buses, but use, how they use it. Please have some form of education for these. Just, don't writers. just throw it out there. I, yeah. I understood. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yes, Mr. Rothwell. So we've talked in a general way about how to uh, publicize this program, but do we have a specific program set up? to publicize this? Or are we just going to talk about it in a kind of a general way and hope it happens? Well, no. it would be a coordination between planning and uh, or the team to uh, have an outreach to, to. And we have something in the works for doing that we, right now? We will. We, we will. will. We'll, we have to. There's no question about that. It would be nice if we could have a marketing manager board to help us do that. <laughs> but the timing doesn't match. Yeah. Uh, as Isaac talked about, if, he, if we get this uh, uh, out on the street in August and get it awarded and hopefully in the first quarter of next year have it uh, installed, that doesn't match what we did in the budget, which is to hold back on the marketing manager until after November. Then I have to start a hiring process. That takes probably several months. They just don't match. So we'll have to find those resources internally to put together a good plan. Um, we do have that... Uh, um, uh, we do have a contract with Miller, Max, Field, yeah. I always mess it up. Yeah, I mean, just uh, we'll use, we'll yeah. use those resources again to help us get the word out. He, he's just done a fabulous job for us, um, and the price is right, so we'll definitely do it. Does Will we get to help? see the end result of that presented here? We, I'd be happy to present uh, like progress to reports it. on how we're doing. I think that would be great, yeah.
And then, if I might, uh, I just I just really wanted to give some kudos to Isaac. Well deserved. He's been a very patient man. Um, he's he's been ready and wanting to do this for quite a while, um, a few years, and he keeps coming to me and saying, "Do we have the money?" And we've we've been patient. He's built a spec, and over the last three years, he's probably had no less than what 15 or 20 vendors come to this property and present their wares. And the beauty of that is, it's not really about trying to become aligned with any particular vendor, but just getting that information from them about what their product is, what components of that product we like and don't like, what's different from another vendor, and then he's been able to build a spec that matches us, what we need. And it may not be any particular vendor, it may be a vendor that has to modify what they do to meet our need. So he's been patient, he's done a great job. Um, I look forward to getting this out on the street and and uh, rewarding you with a installation. <laughs> yeah, in addition, I'd like to add, I, I'm a member of the, uh, the CTAA IT committee, and so I'm in communication with colleagues in their experiences, so I'm getting a little reference information on their experiences with different vendors and the pitfalls they may have run into. I attend APTA Transit Tech, I'm involved in APTA, <clears throat> so there is, uh, there is a lot of information there as well, so I've been doing a lot of research. Matthews? So presumably it goes out to a RFQ, RF, whatever, RFQ, yeah. and do you have a way of building into that something about uh, performance criteria in other entities? Um, <clears throat> I think that would be more of a, I think that would be a question for procurement because they do have, uh, there is a, a boilerplate. We can we can, of course, adjust that to accordingly to... Uh, it's not a bad thing to incorporate to the extent you legally can, because I'm sure some people, you know, they look good on paper and yeah. performance I, I, is if, not, not so much. Further detail, Aaron could speak to that further if you like. I, I, I don't need it now, but I, to the extent you yeah. can build in something like that, it's helpful to have it there as a, to as a factor. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Uh, any comments from the public? Um, would, uh, I would be happy to make the motion uh, uh, for the. Uh, <laughs> I know. <laughs> I'll enthusiastically second. Though. <laughs> I have a motion to second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? So ordered. Okay, I just want to announce too that. Uh, yeah. Thank you, everybody. We do have copies of headways and news clips of uh, recent uh, weeks of uh, metro activities. Um, without any other additions, uh, we will have our next meeting on Friday, August 24th at 9 a.m. at the Scotts Valley City Council Chamber in Scotts Valley. This meeting is adjourned.